tonight. I, if, um, if you didn't take part in last night, my name is Brittany Fouts. I co-direct RCE Salisbury with Brian Polkinghorn. Um, Brian and I both, we actually base our RCE location out of the Bosman Center of Conflict Resolution here in Salisbury, Maryland, of which Brian is the director of. Um, tonight, we actually have a change in a little bit of the schedule. We're going to be starting off with RCE Georgetown. Maeve and Peg are going to be um, conducting this presentation, and the title of their presentation tonight is Sustainable Organization Trainings for Georgetown County Public Services. Peg and Maeve, would you like to share your screen with your presentation? Uh, I also sure. have it ready to go on mine if you want. I'm not sure actually if Maeve has made it on yet, so. Okay. Do you see her in the list, Brittany? I didn't see your name. I'll look for you right now. Oops. No, I don't see Maeve. She was out in the field uh, yesterday at this time and she didn't text me, so she might have had a problem, but um, I'll pretend I'm Maeve to begin with. <laughs> So uh, let me just get started then. I'm Peg Howell. I'm affiliated with the Georgetown RISE, the Georgetown RCE RISE in our case stands for uh, Resilience, Innovation, Sustainability, and Education or Through Education. And um, our um, introduction into uh, all this work came through Pam Martin, who many of you know. Um, Pam isn't able to be with us this evening either, um, but Maeve, Pam, and I have worked um, very closely with uh, Georgetown County government. We have, as I think Pam has reported before, we have a group of interns from Coastal Carolina University who work um, every spring and summer, Pam recruits them uh, annually, uh, to work in, um, in our government in various uh, departments. So we're um, so it was interesting to hear Philip's comment uh, toward the end of last night that it was like only one percent of the projects were um, government associated. Nearly all of the work that CCU is doing and Georgetown Rise is doing is um, associated with our local Georgetown County government. So I'm going to uh, give you a little uh, orientation to us. <laughs> um, we're in the United States in South Carolina um, along the coast. Um, in a small county, 61,000 people in Georgetown County, um, our county seat is Georgetown, and you can see that we are um, on the coast and therefore um, very heavily um, in need of focusing on resilience and sustainability. Uh, just to give you a little more detail about the county, we have five rivers that are watersheds that come into Winya Bay, this area here, and then into the ocean. Um, so we have, um, during the last six years, I believe, experienced six uh, significant storms, hurricanes and one ice storm that have um, had some really dramatic impact on our ability to uh, be responsive. And um, we're finally learning to be a bit more proactive as it relates to, um, to increasing threats of sea level rise and storms. Um, by the way, this is Maeve's part of the presentation, so I'm really winging it here. <laughs> okay, so uh, this is our sweet little town uh, of Georgetown, um, South Carolina. You can see we have, you know, a main street um, uh, right on uh, one of our rivers, and in the background you can see um, some heavy industrialization we have um, a power plant, a um, paper mill, and an electric, um, uh, sorry, a, a steel uh, mill, all right outside of our town. So the relationship in, between industrialization and tourism is um, intimately interconnected here. Um, this is what Georgetown looks like on a sunny day. Uh, this is what Georgetown has looked like through many of the storms that we've had in the past several years of the hurricanes that names that are very familiar to those of us on the coast, Matthew, Florence, um, Irene, and, and on and on. So uh, we have, like Charleston, also some sunny day flooding, and um, we do our best to um, educate our community uh, about not just reacting, but what, the, um, what Georgetown Rise can do to help 
get our community, especially our county leaders, to start thinking about what we can uh, do to uh, be more resilient. In that vein, uh, we took on a project um, with SDG number 11 in mind um, to work directly with our public services department, um, something that we've developed called sustainable organization training. Um, here they are in a, um, in a uh, first part of the training that we did, which obviously uh, involved an experiential problem. Um, but you can see here that we have um, the manager for the public services department and all the areas that are seriously impacted um, by storms, um, capital projects, uh, vehicles, uh, stormwater across the county, our airport, um, landfill and recycling, all the buildings, all the facilities that are owned by the county and roads. So they came to us essentially saying, uh, we need help with our strategic plan. We need help because we're gonna be getting um, a, uh, reaccredited by the APWA, the American Public Works Association, and we need to be more effective as a team. They had had a, a tremendous amount of turnover in their leadership. Um, I'm sorry, Maeve, I just got a text. I, I think Maeve is on. Maeve, do you want to jump in? Hi, Peg. Um, okay. Hi, everyone. <laughs> I'm very okay. sorry. I, I cut my times. Um, do you want to take over from here? You want me to keep going? Sure, sure. I'm happy to go from this slide. And thanks, everyone, for your patience. I'm really sorry. <laughs> Um, all right, so I think Peg just gave you some background on this training for the Public Services Department for Georgetown County, South Carolina. Um, the goals for this training, we had a few different outcomes that we were looking for. First and foremost, we wanted to help the department to complete their reaccreditation with the American Public Works Association. This was something they had to do anyway, but they recognized it as an opportunity to improve their knowledge about sustainability and resilience. Um, in addition to that, as part of that process, they recognized the importance of updating their mission, vision, and values um, so that they could work more effectively and integrate these concepts of sustainability and resilience as a department. And then we wanted to help them to align their division's goals and objectives to that updated mission, vision, values, and how to execute um, those shared goals. And so um, we wanted to overall help their leadership team improve their functioning to um, better serve the county in um, providing the normal government services that they do, but in a way that allows for improved resilience and sustainability. So our process for this training series um, we started with essentially a needs assessment. Um, we conducted interviews with the different department uh, employees. We called it the Sustainable Organization Survey. So that survey really helped us to create a tailored training series. Um, it was meant to be a, a model training series that could be adapted, but it was very customized to this particular department. So after that survey, we analyzed those results. We um, presented those observations and findings to the department at, through a summary report. And from there, we were able to move on to the other steps of the training process. So the survey that we conducted, you don't need to read this table here, but it was made up of questions that um, accomplished two goals. One, one portion of the survey assessed their familiarity with resilience and sustainability. The other portion looked at their organi organizational resilience and how well they achieved their goals. So um, next slide, Peg. What we found from this portion of the survey focused on their familiarity is that most of the department was familiar with these general concepts but there was a wide range of knowledge expressed. A lot of people um, found that through doing this survey, they, they kind of came to know what they didn't know. Um, we were sort of able to reveal those knowledge gaps and um, show them what their distribution of knowledge was throughout the department. 
most everyone in the on the team has this long-term planning mindset but expressed that there are barriers to actually taking action so long-term planning was recognized as being really important to their individual roles but as an entire department, they, they really suffered from being short-sighted or reactive, and they weren't able to apply the long-term planning that they knew how to do individually as a team. So this table is actually one that I, I was really um, intrigued by when I looked back at it. Thanks, Brittany. Um, it shows the range of topics that they cover as a department. Overall, it, show, it paints a picture of a department that has worked through several repeated um, disasters, hurricanes, and floods, but notably, very few of them focus on communication, public health, or inequality at the time of the survey. Next slide. All right, I'm going to move through this pretty quickly, but the main thing that I wanted to point out is that we helped the department to tie their decision making to evidence, science-based decisions uh, rooted in climate projections and climate um, data. So we had specific data downscaled to the county and we took it through them, we took them through it in a way that helped them to align it with um, the sustainable development goals. Next slide. So, you know, we would look at a variable like heavy rainfall, really intense storms, and we would say, what sustainable development goals does that impact? And we also use tools such as the NOAA sea level rise viewer that help them to visualize these future conditions and even overlap it with things like critical facilities, all the things like fire, schools, police that they interact with normally anyway. So I think I'm going to uh, step in here, right, Meg? Yes, take it away, Meg. Okay. So uh, I just want to spend a second on this slide because what I found uh, really interesting in educating this group was uh, that they really knew their particular problem set as it related to jobs, or oh, sorry, roads, if they were responsible for roads or the airport or the, the recycling areas but they didn't have a holistic view of what flooding and storms and sea level rise were doing to the county. And when Maeve introduced the sea level rise viewer, there were a haws around the room. Um, people literally got on the tool and started looking at where they live, where their daughters live, where their you know, grandchildren live, and looking at different years uh, into the forecast, in five years, it's gonna look like this. In 10 years, it's gonna look like this. In 40 years, it's gonna look like this. And it gave them an entirely new appreciation for longer term uh, planning. And it gave them a better appreciation for the need to integrate their planning, that they really are looking at a whole system here, not just at their individual sets of responsibilities. So um, the second part of the survey had to do with their resilience as a team, their effectiveness as a team, and their ability as a team to withstand whatever challenges came about. So uh, I, again, as May said, we're not gonna go into this, but we asked them 14 questions um, that are based on a model that was developed, um, I'll say probably in the 60s by a professor at MIT who I knew named Richard Beckhart, um, now deceased. Um, but the, it, it's a simple model that came about from years of observation of how teams perform and how high, uh, highly effective teams perform. And it basically says this, teams that, have, that are highly effective have very clear role, goals and they have um, such consistency in understanding each other's goals that they're able to step into um, each other's um, needs um, and understanding. It also gives them a, a long-term strategic line of sight and helps them in um, making sure that they're able to achieve the results that they have set out. Secondly, teams have very clear roles and responsibilities and those roles and responsibilities are aligned with goals. 
the procedures are what's required to accomplish the goals in each other's roles. So things like effective meeting management, decision making, conflict management are all really critical procedures. And then ultimately, interpersonal re relationships are going to be very high if those if that sequence of goals, roles, and procedures are in place. So using that um, model, we looked at the results and we found some very interesting things um, about this team. First of all, they were not accomplishing their goals and were very frustrated by that. And we can see that that's because their, the clarity of their goals was not very high in the scheme of things. What they were really good at was doing their job, staying in their lane, taking care of roads or taking care of buildings or taking care of the particular um, set of responsibilities they had. They were also really good at taking care of the customer, even though sometimes it killed them to get it done. So taking care of people's needs around the county or um, other departments. What they were missing were really well-established decision-making and meeting management skills and um, they were pretty short on tools like conflict resolution. And then finally, um, finally, they, um, their energy was high, but it was really um, a high burnout situation. Let me just sort of get to the bottom here. What, was, what we realized was um, to make them a more resilient team, we had to move from sort of the classic hierarchy um, which had the manager in the middle providing direction to each and every member and get them to a place where they were more collaborative, better able to um, respond to the various problems that they faced in a collective way um, to do more integrated strategic planning and so forth. With that understanding, when they moved into um, their strategic planning, um, they were much more effective in identifying goals that they needed to work on together. Uh, so, I'm going to, due to the con time constraints, uh, oh, okay, Robert, I'm thanks. sorry. No, um, that's not a problem. Just, I just want to tell you that the manager won the APWA Presidential Leadership Award as the result of the work that we did with them, and we're very proud of him and that whole team. Thanks so much. Thanks, Peg. Thanks, yeah, Nate. Thank you. This is just yeah. a reminder to everybody, Roberto is going to introduce our next participants, but we really have to keep to like the 10 minute at the very most presentation limit. So, Roberto, would you like to um, introduce our next speaker? Yes, I would. Uh, next up, we have RC North Texas, and they'll be discussing eco patterns facing sustainability and resiliency. And that will be given by uh, Ms. Oriana Silva. So, if you're ready. Yes. Good afternoon, everyone. How are you doing? Hi. Hi. I will share my screen right now. Um, can you all see my screen? Yes, we can. Okay, great. Um, let me show this. Okay, here we go. Well, welcome to this presentation. I'm Mariana Silva. I'm representing the RCA North Texas chapter, especially the Youth Network. And I will talk about the eco interns facing sustainability and resiliency at Dallas College. So we're a team of three interns composed by Dallas North Lake Campus and Brookhaven Campus sustainability interns. They are my partners, um, Amina Joseph, and Joey Wambua, and myself, Ariana Silva, um, for an that we have in Canvas. So at the beginning of this year, we held an RC International Youth Meeting in February. We tried to exchange ideas with a youth ambassador around the world. We have representations from um, different continents, almost all of them, all the Americas, um, Asia, and Europe. Uh, we address different issues that concern our, everybody around the world. And some of them were this management uh, by Dallas County Health Human Service. Uh, I have to highlight that during this presentation, we address how to prevent COVID-19 
and how people can face this disease. Even so, even though it wasn't declared as a pan pandemic at that time. So we educate our students and community before it happened. Then well, we'll talk about sustainable social medias, um, how to uh, engage students and faculty through Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. Um, climate solution projects uh, for Brookhaven campus. Uh, we talk about the RC Monarch project, which is um, with the aliens with uh, NASA and the master naturalist. We talked Monarch butterfly uh, last week, and so we can we we can know if where is the the path that we they will follow for the next uh, season. Um, we talk about awareness initiatives at Fort Worth. Um, environmental engineering that uh, the Nimitz High School developed. Those students uh, develop uh, solar panels for their school. Um, the Lake Cleanup uh, Initiative by the Richland Campus. And also we have an international speaker, uh, Dr. Uma Mahapur. She's from India and she talked a little bit about the health challenges that India is facing right now. It was pretty varied, this um, conversation. Um, we, it lasts around two hours and a half. But I know for sure many people around the world uh, learn how things are happening, not only in the North Texas area, also in other countries. Well, before COVID, we also host activities outside our campus. We partnered with uh, Dallas Arboretum and the Green Team Coalition. We went uh, with, uh, to the Dallas Arboretum and we got a guided visit where we learned about plants and environment. We also did clean up uh, with the Green Team Coalition and our uh, creeks next to the Brookhaven campus. And well, as you know, um, Earth Day was coming on April 22nd. So since it was the 50th anniversary of, the, of Earth Day, we host an event 50 year for 50 days. So it, this campaign starts on March 3rd and it ends Earth Day. So basically we try to host um, many activities online and in person where students, faculty, staff, and people from the community uh, could engage and learn a little bit more about environment, environment, society, and economy as well. And what is uh, in, in all. Um, this was an activity that we host at Brookhaven. It was an eco workshop for elementary and middle school students from the Farmers Branch and Cartoon ISD. Uh, these kids went to our campus to learn a little bit more about how to recycle and the importance of not throwing away the food. Um, this is an issue that is, is pretty common in the United States that we see many students that they don't have the time now to eat their lunch or their breakfast during the school time and they mostly throw away the food. And so basically the, we talk about, you know, you can recycle this thing from your lunch pack and you can also uh, save this food and all that stuff to raise awareness about the other students that don't have uh, food or they have the facility to have um, uh, alimentation. Okay. Um, so before uh, spring break, if you know, um, March 13, we uh, we declared that COVID-19 was a pandemic and all the classes went online. So that week, um, March 10th, we held a site pre-break fair. And this fair, we talk about how to reduce the plastic during our vacations and how to be eco in the spring break. And um, it was pretty good. We talked with students, we talked about sustainability. We, ha we have giveaway, as you see, we have a wheel here of prices. So people were very engaged with uh, our activities. So 
Therefore, after Mike went on online, it was a challenge how to keep the community engaged with sustainability with the Earth Day, with our 50 day, 50 years campaign. And so we create an, a student journal. This is student journal is the first sustainable journal funded by Dallas College students for students. It started uh, in, April, in April as a Word document, and then we developed them through MailStream, and now we have a website where you can be able to see our contents, articles, and you can subscribe to our journal. So this student led journal provides an environment for students to develop academic research concerning different areas like social justice, human health, and well-being, philosophy, science, technology, engineering, and math, climate action, and business. So basically the mission and vision of this journal is engage a student from different majors, and not only from Dallas College, also from the area of North Texas. And so they can express their uh, concerns, their knowledge, their research, because most of them have done research before. And some topics that aren't hidden right now around the world. Um, so you can see here, um, we have three main categories, society, environment, and economy, that are the three main branches of sustainability. So each time you click on there, you can see different articles for each category. Well, other activities that we have done during uh, this pandemic time was the iNaturals competition. This competition was hosted by my colleague, Joy Wampua, where people not only from Dallas College, also around the world, uh, com com compared uh, with the picture. So the, the main reason of this is like, we are all at home seated and closed and this, promotes that you can take a walk. You don't need to go with a, to a crowded place to discover animals or plants or bugs. So you can just take a walk around your neighborhood and discover many amazing things. So this competition was made for that. Go to walk, try to be healthy, and then discover and learn what are you seeing during this, those walks. So this competition was a success. It has around 70,000 observations, 3,000 species identified, uh, 1,000 identifiers, and 36 observers. So observers were the people that actually sign up and were doing that weekly. So we had like weekly, like, okay, this week will be supposed to just for plants, this week for bugs or birds, so we did that per category. And it lasts from July, one, July 1st to August 31st through all the summer. And now they're hosting another for fall. If you want to make your closing comments, Oriana. Okay, I will just, uh, these are the social medias, uh, the Twitter, um, Instagram, you can see here the competition, the videos. Also uh, here is the other sustainable North Lake. Um, we also have uh, videos uh, about how to grow vegetables and fruits at home in partnership with Dallas Arboretum. Uh, I encourage you all to see that because it's a good activity that you can do at home. And um, we work with the SDG Action, Action Manager performance. Uh, is, I highly recommend you. It can help you to improve your performance um, at your university or college. Thank you, and Oriana. Also, we do, we do uh, gardening in the community, in the our community college. Uh, we have the Wimmel Garden, which is a pollinator garden with native uh, species. And well, we found a lot of monarch butterflies there. And we have the Romero Garden, which is a vegetable garden at North Lake campus. Um, well, these are, thank you so much. This is my contact information. I hope you like my presentation and have a good evening. Thank you very much. Um...
sorry, we just need to maintain the schedule. Uh, I, I hate to be that guy, but um, up next we have a uh, RCE Grand Rapids and we'll be learning from Gail and her update. Good evening and welcome and greetings from RCE Grand Rapids. Um, I will be presenting tonight with uh, my colleague Eric Nordman. I'm going to try to do a very quick three minutes. My timer is on. Um, we are uh, hailing from Grand Rapids, Michigan in the United States. I brought for you a map. Our spot is this little star and um, we are home to 20% of the world's fresh water and we're very um, careful to understand that. And so we spend much time thinking about it. Um, I'm going to uh, hopefully know how to move this slide forward. And it's not moving, let's go. Uh, I wanna start with a thank you too. Um, our last meeting was at Shelburne Farms and that has sustained me and I'm sure many of us throughout the year. And I wanna say a grateful thank you to all that were participated in making that such an amazing and informative and important time um, last year and some memories from that time. So um, greetings to you and thank you again for, for that important experience. Um, I'm gonna spend some time talking about um, some of the informal and formal educational opportunities we've been doing in Grand Rapids. And I'm gonna try to um, think forward more than backward. Um, but I do wanna mention that I left Shelburne Farms and came running back to Grand Rapids a tad early so that I could be participating in a group conversation with um, Paul Hawken as he was keynote to a conversation in Grand Rapids, bringing us together to talk about how we might um, think about our climate action planning. It was hosted by our West Michigan U.S. Green Building Council, who also supports our Michigan Battle of the Buildings and Grand Rapids 2030 district, where we collaborate together to try to look at our um, uh, impact on climate through energy reduction. Um, we started our RCE in 2007. We were acknowledged in 2007, um, primarily through a community sustainability partnership with business, education, and, and government. It was designated to the city. Um, that collaboration is being um, reimagined into a new community collaboration on climate change. Um, this community sustainability um, reimagination is looking more deeply at integrating all um, aspects of our community with a stronger network on social justice and social equity. Um, moving forward, we are hopeful again, um, without any um, government lockdowns, to host our youth virtual conference. It will be our fifth so please watch for more information on that. Um, we are hosting the eighth annual Weggy Prize, which is another opportunity to connect our youth to an important and interesting transdisciplinary and intercollegiate opportunity to solve wicked problems. So I hope that you look for that information soon. And our universities of, um, have collaborated across 15 colleges and colleges and universities to host a um, Earth Day 50.5 next week on the 22nd because of our COVID lockdown in, in April, we weren't able to host Earth Days. So you're all invited and I will share that information again on our slide deck that is um, going to be available. You may all participate with us. Um, and now I want to turn over the rest of my time to Eric Nordman, who's going to share his important research in St. Vincent, the Grenadines. Now I'm going to start right. so Eric can jump in. Thank you very much, Gail. Uh, there we go. Okay, share. There we go. All right. Um, yeah, th so this was a project that uh, I did with students at Grand Valley and uh, in St. Vincent and the Grenadines in um, the Caribbean. So St. Vincent and the Grenadines is vulnerable to many hazards. Um, First of all, it's a long way from Grand Rapids for sure. Um, so this was an interesting project, um, but climate change is adding to the list. Uh, storms and coastal damage, landslides, 
um, coastal erosion, uh, earthquakes and volcanoes. Uh, it's a small country, but it's very uh, hazard prone. So I worked with the uh, Pan American Development Foundation uh, to create a curriculum to train young adults in disaster risk reduction and climate change uh, adaptation. And uh, we built this curriculum and um, then I handed the curriculum off to uh, my partners in St. Vincent and the Grenadines. Uh, Christabel Ashton was the main one. And um, we trained 163 young adults in all kinds of uh, techniques in uh, community um, sustainability and resiliency um, uh, techniques. And then back in Grand Rapids, um, I was teaching a, a ge geographic information systems class, and we used that information uh, from St. Vincent, uh, the island itself, St. Vincent, to create a landslide risk model. And um, landslides are, are one of the, the main hazards, uh, especially in the interior of the country. And um, it's really harmful to, uh, well, farm, there's a lot of farming on steep slopes. Uh, there's infrastructure damage. So understanding where the most vulnerable sites are can uh, reduce that, that risk um, and hopefully even save lives. So that is my presentation. Um, so it was a really interesting collaboration between um, folks here in Grand Rapids and in uh, St. Vincent and the Grenadines. So thanks a lot for this opportunity to share our work. And thanks, Gail. Thanks, Eric and Gail. Uh, up next, we have uh, RCE Greater Burlington. And for that one, we will be hearing from Ms. Jen Cerullo. Yeah, hi, everybody. Uh, thanks, Gail, for the shout out. Uh, so nice to have you all in Vermont last year. Um, I'm really excited to be sharing with you a little bit about um, some of the work that the RCE Greater Burlington is doing. Um, and some of you saw last night the collaboration with Puerto Rico and um, there's lots of local collaborations as well we're really excited about. So what I wanted to share with you tonight with my co-presenters, um, Sophia and Kieran, um, is a little bit about the sustainable development goals and youth engagement. And so Sophia and Kieran in a moment are gonna join me, but I wanted to just say that youth voice, place-based learning, EFS and the Sustainable Development Goals are, are really foundational to the education um, that we're doing here in Vermont. And we have um, four different ways that we've been engaging youth um, in the Sustainable Development Goals and really thinking about what does it look like to, to learn, to teach and learn um, for a more just, healthy, and sustainable world. Um, so some of the activities have included um, engaging in a global goals week, um, the Burlington City and Lake semester, which um, Sophia and Kieran will share with you. Um, as many of you who were with us last year got to meet students that are part of cultivating pathways to sustainability. And then finally, just a brief moment if we have time to share about our professional learning programs um, that really are supporting educators and thinking about, well, how do I support youth voice, place-based place learning and education for sustainability? Um, so this year, um, the University of Vermont and Shelburne Farms, um, along with many other local partners, hosted um, Global Goals Week. And so this was a statewide and university-wide activities. Um, and one of the activities that young people engaged in really deepening their understanding of place was to, to um, investigate the place with the lens of the sustainable development goals um, and really looking to see how do we compare it to other cities of our size. Um, Burlington's a city of about 42,000 folks um, and so looking at other cities that are in the same range, how do we compare um, on education, on clean water and sanitation, gender equality, and really having um, young people think about um, what and then what can we do to um, improve how we're doing on these sustainable development goals in relation to other communities of our size. Um, so this was a semester-based project and they just were able to share that um, in September. Um, the other program that I'm really excited to share is a semester-based program 
Um, and Sophia and Kieran, I'll have you unmute yourselves and just share so that folks can hear directly from the students that are in this program now. Can you hear me? Yes. Wonderful. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Kieran Blakeney, and I'm a junior at Burlington High School. Um, Burlington City Lake program is many things, but at its core, it's an immersive learning experience in the city of Burlington. Um, it gives students a strong sense of place while learning about social justice and sustainability. Um, I took um, the Burlington City Lake program because I was bored of traditional classroom learning and I wanted real world, ex real world experience, excuse me. Um, PCL has given this to me. Um, it's a unique curriculum has allowed us to talk with community leaders and activists on racial justice, sustainability, and city systems. Currently, we are creating a student-led video about racial injustice in Burlington, where we are interviewing government officials. Um, BCL's sense of community and special curriculum has brought me closer with the city and the world. Um, I really enjoyed the hands-on learning and the real world experience it offers. Thanks, Kieran. And Sophia. Yeah, um, well, hello, I'm Sophia. I'm a junior in Burlington High School. Um, I'm doing Burlington City Lake because of the opportunities and resources provided to us. I found it benefiting me with, again, how small the course was. Um, I found myself taking all the skills I learned in BCL into my everyday life. Um, I think it's quite unique that we're allowed to have uncomfortable conversations and we broke those barriers so quickly. Um, I think BCL really allowed me to grow and improve as a person and my mindset with like education, especially when learning about systems such as sustainability and housing and transportation, those aren't really stuff you learn with traditional school. Awesome, thank you, Sophia. It's so much better to hear from the students than to hear from me, but I, I'm so pleased that they could join us. Um, you'll see in our presentation in the slides too, there's some links um, to their blogs and hopefully that video that will get posted soon. I'm really excited about that. I think unique um, to, the, to the Burlington City and Lake semester program um, really is youth voice and that, connect, that deep connection to place. Um, the, Third program, just to briefly share with you, is um, the Cultivating Pathways to Sustainability. And, and thanks to Philip and Nancy, um, we were able to write this project up in a re recent RCE publication. So thank you for that support, Philip. Um, and Nancy, if you're on. <laughs> um, this program, when we went virtual last year, um, students were still really excited to continue to engage in um, community-based projects and even in the virtual context they were still reaching out to community partners and working to address the sustainable development goals in their community and um, we began this year again also in a virtual context but because we're virtual and we're not necessarily meeting in place in person we were able to include um, students from further afield and so this year we're excited to welcome students from um, uh, community in Nepal, um, at the Copala Valley School, um, a boarding school in Mississippi, Piney Woods School, as well as some regional partners, um, really helping the students broaden their sense of what is a sustainable community, um, youth voice and network, and to have young people really um, work across the globe to address big issues. Um, you heard Sophia and Kieran talk about um, injustice and the Black Lives Matter movement has been really strong here in Vermont, but also for young people to hear about how um, students in Nepal are also concerned and standing in solidarity has been a really powerful moment for, for all of the students. Um, and I'll end with sort of what I'm passionate about, which is teacher education. We know that students don't have the opportunities to engage with the sustainable development goals if their teachers are not familiar with it and if it's not coming into the classroom. And so we continue to provide support. Um, Shelburne Farms and, and UVM are working to develop a certificate, a graduate certificate in education for sustainability with the sustainable development goals as a core component. Um, all of our courses really align nicely with the goals. Um, and we continue to provide resources to support educators here in uh, Vermont, but as well um, internationally. 
So I think we'll end there. Thank you so much for having us tonight. And thanks so much to Kieran and Sophia for taking their time tonight with, with me. Thank you so much, Jen. It was so good to see you. <laughs> thanks. Hi, everyone. Uh, we're going to move ahead to our next presentation, RCE Saskatchewan, with mm -hmm. Mr. Yonath Jonathan Yee. His presentation is the right color blue. Uh, I'm just trying to share my screen. I also have your presentation just in case, too. Okay. Good. Looks like, is it working? Looks great. Yeah, we can okay. see it. Looks really great. good quality. <laughs> My name is John Yee. I'm with RC Saskatchewan. I've been with them since 2009, on and off. Um, and most recently, after I came back from a trip from Lebanon working with refugees, I thought that it would be cool to incorporate the SDGs and um, refugees together. So what I did was I partnered with my cousins who are artists and an amateur writer, and we created a children's book uh, about refugees and many SDGs. Uh, so uh, what we found out was that education has fallen behind in today's issues and we need to focus more on informal and non-formal education because these topics are becoming really politicalized and to get this information to the public easier we should hear away from political coffee points I guess. And so that's why a children's book. Uh, so the problem is that a lot of textbooks in education still are not up to date and there's stereotypical images of migration and migrants uh, being taught. So the opportunity that we researched was from UNICEF and that uh, books, children's books do help and we need to get relevant information to children and teachers. I'm going over these um, slides really fast. You guys can read it after because they'll be online. Um, so why a children's book? Um, because it gives moralistic, simple, and educational information to the public. Um, and it's important to have access to SDG content when you're young. And it's a great way for scaffolding um, to teach the public. Uh, so what is this book about? So we entitled it The Right Color Blue focuses on immigration and utilizes conventure, uh, conventional adventure and transformational plot elements with a rhyming scheme. The rhyming scheme is easier to understand and remember information. And the way we use it is basically how fairy tales and movies and other TV shows uh, use storytelling. Uh, so we took into consideration the benefit of a host country and the benefits of why immigration is important to the host country and we identified three major topics which is productivity innovation and tax collection and we incorporate that into the book so the key concepts uh, was resistance to immigration so the main characters are clouds and in the group uh, the clouds in the group will only take the color blue and actively discriminate against other colors of uh, clouds who use them. So basically what happens is in the story, uh, the clouds are in a valley because of climate change, the water is getting, uh, the lake is drying up and they need to search for more water. But uh, I guess, I'm not sure if it's racist or whatever, they don't like other color of water and they only like a certain color of blue. And so the main character needs to go outside of their comfort zone and find new fresh water to survive. Um, another one is methods of combating resistance. So uh, it's understanding other cultures and why the benefit of other culture or other cultures are beneficial to a host country. And the moral is to be able to shift acceptance to others. Um, how did we come up with all these learning things? We used the learning objectives from UNESCO's Education for Sustainable Development Goals Learning Objectives, which focuses on cognitive, social, emotional, and behavioral outcomes. Um, so in, in the framework, there's a bunch of different uh, cognitive, social, and behavioral learnings that um, is recommended. 
Uh, but so we picked the three here that we felt was most important to the book. So the learner understands the inequality is a major driver for, for societal problems and individual dissatisfaction. Uh, Social emotional learning objectives, the learner is able to raise awareness about inequalities in their own world. And the behavioral learning objectives, the learning is able to identify and analyze different types of causes and reasons for inequalities. And so through those, we created more other learnings within those learnings, I guess. And so, and this is only a few of them in the book that I picked. Uh, the shrink of the puddle that I talked about, climate change is causing shrinking, the main source of food, the hate of colored water, the rejection of discrimination, immigration immigrants, and the rejection of Taylor. Because Taylor returns from his journey to save his friends, but he's changed and is not accepted by some of them, but accepted by some others. Um, the social emotional learning objectives, uh, learner is able to learn about the method of identifying inequalities, the exploration outside of your own context, question your own context, interacting with outside knowledge. Um, and this is an example of stories raised in awareness through verbal communication to a large group of peers. So be able to translate what they learned in a book into the real world. Uh, and our behavioral learning objective is to um, discover the inequality of the group through exploration from outside of the group dynamic and positive conversations with others. One of the prevailing reasons people find it difficult to raise awareness of inequalities are, uh, is their inability to identify them in the first place as they live within their own context. So we hope this book helps them discover and reach out of their own little bubble to see the benefits of others. And final slide, this is just an example of the text. So this is four, or I guess each Rectangle is two pages and there's a little bit of the art uh, of what the book looks like. And done. Thanks. Thanks, Jonathan. That was awesome. Uh, up next, we have R.C. Bogota and we have Dr. Paez. Hello, good afternoon. So I'm hey, hello. Put the presentation. Okay. Hello, everyone. It's real nice to be here. Uh, okay, we're going to present to you the results that we have had from our project that we present three years ago in Vancouver. So it's really nice uh, to be here sharing with you the results that we have had these past three years. Uh, I'm going to introduce Marcela Rodriguez. She's one of our young leaders and she's going to start our presentation. So, Marcela. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. My name is Marcela Rodriguez, member of this project. So I want to talk to you about today is youth as an engine to promote sustainable lifestyles in Colombia. So who are we? We are a movement promoted by young leaders from different universities. We are students and graduates from different um, universities and professions trained in sustainable lifestyles and SDGs as well. We spread a message of sustainability to communities here in Colombia in different cities, making this involve those initiatives and um, companies that are committed to the environment to create a sustainable cities and communities. So our main goal is to promote the adoption of sustainable lifestyles to train informed and responsible consumers uh, we think that information is really important so that people could uh, become a responsible consumer, that with their daily actions uh, could uh, help reduce environmental impacts associated with our lifestyles to create more sustainable cities. So our numbers since 2018, we have been in more than 50 events. We have reached more than 3,000 people in events and uh, 23,000 followers on social networks. We think social networks are really important in order to connect to youth uh, nowadays. Uh, we have made alliances with more than 50 organizations that help us spread the message throughout the country. We have this group of 34 young leaders. Uh, they are uh, the base of our project. They help us spread the message. They are here with us in every event. And now with COVID, uh, we continue working with them virtually. We also work with sustainable brands, different brands that help us uh, 
to achieve the adoption of these sustainable lifestyles. We know that uh, lifestyles are divided in five domains that are food, mobility, uh, housing, leisure, and consumer goods. So these brands help us in that way to uh, promote local consumption and promote also uh, local communities and inter entrepreneurships. We have different allies. We started working with UN Environment at first with the uh, program What One Planet Live With Care. Now we continue working with different allies such as the Swiss Embassy in Colombia, the Ministry of Environmental and Sustainable Development here in Colombia as well, and different organizations that are uh, part of the ministry and also RCE as our main ally in the development of this project. Uh, so these are our social networks. We have Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, email, uh, a website, also a YouTube channel and a podcast uh, channel. So I'm gonna show you really quickly our uh, 2018 results where we worked with the UN Environment on sustainable lifestyles adoption. So what I'm going to talk to you about here is that uh, in this year uh, we started, we had uh, 25 events, we reached more than a thousand people um, uh, in events and 7,000 people on social networks. We also did a first course for young leaders on sustainability and sustainable lifestyles. Here you can see some pictures of our work in different events uh, throughout the year, mainly in the city of Bogota, that is the capital of Colombia. So as part of the indicators that show us the measurements of the impact of the project, we have had quali qualitative and quantitative uh, indicators such as surveys and the calculation of the carbon footprint. So to show you uh, really quickly our main results, we calculated the carbon footprint of mobility of five different um, types of means of transportation here in the city of Bogota. And what we did is that with the, uh, uh, the actions that we promoted on sustainable lifestyles, we could see a reduction in the use of the car. Also in food, we analyzed different types of food such as beef, chicken, pork and rice. And we also uh, promoted different actions to reduce this footprint. And this showed a really uh, good results. So finally, uh, I'm gonna talk to you about some conclusions that we uh, achieved in this project in terms of each of the domains of the sustainable lifestyles. First, we showed how um, the project has enabled youth to mobilize in a more sustainable way. Uh, more infrastructure and enabling conditions are needed to people here in Bogota and in all Colombia to adopt these sustainable lifestyles. Also in terms of food, eh, our, our participants were able to change the way they feed and understand that environmental e impacts associated with food and packaging. Uh, and also in terms of consumer goods, um, people have shown how they became more aware about the way they buy and acquire goods. Uh, more emphasis should be made in some actions such as purchasing used goods and uh, other terms of um, practicing these sustainable lifestyles in terms of buying. In the terms of leisure, uh, we, was, we must um, achieve more actions that promote sustainable tourism and in addition of low carbon celebrations. And in terms of housing, we have to uh, promote more the terms of saving water and energy and different actions such, such as co composting and home gardening must be promoted given that uh, these actions involve more work so um, sometimes are a barrier so that young people could uh, promote them and take them into their lifestyles so i'm going to uh, leave you with diana she is going to talk to you about uh, our results in 2019 and 2020. Okay, thank you, Marcela. Uh, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm going to tell you the results, like Marcela said. Uh, one of the most important things of the last year was that we could replicate the sustainability course for young leaders. We also made new alliances. Also, a uh, other thing that it was really important is that we wanted to have a tool to engage more people when we have these events, uh, the, the one that we can see each other before the pandemic. So one of our results are the Enmol Action Games, 
This is a set of five games. Uh, we have a twister, a smarty, a puzzle, a ladder, and a, a game of virtual water. And what we wanted is that people learn a little more about sustainable lifestyles, but also to have fun in the in, in, while they were doing that. So uh, we have been in universities, uh, schools, also some companies also called us to, to give some talks to, to people that work with them. A other important thing in this year was the alliance that we made with Swiss Agency for Development and Cooperation. Uh, with this alliance, we wanted to inform and promote actions on sustainable lifestyles, emphasizing on water footprint reduction actions, and also uh, by uh, we also wanted to work with the SDGs. And in this case, we decided to work with the uh, Good Life Goals. Uh, we love when in 2018 they uh, like said, okay, the SDGs is no more like this, this uh, thing that is about something in, uh, at a political level or and in the company level. It's also a thing that the people have to talk about it and that can do something about it. So uh, we really like to, to play with the good life goals. Uh, some of the result of the campaign of the last year, it was that we have some, some events, we made new alliances. These are some of the pieces that we use. Uh, like Marcela says, one of our main work is in social networks, is the way that we engage with people. And these are uh, some of the, of the pieces. We like to give information, but not only information, but it, we would like to, to always also give the people like the way, like alternatives. So that's why we have these entrepreneurs that we work with. And uh, something important is the means. Uh, we all re realize that the idea is not what you said, but how you said it. So we have we try to, to set the things in a really fun uh, way so that people can feel connected with what, 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 what we wanted them to know. Uh, in this year, uh, we have continued to work with the with the Swiss Embassy, and also with another universities. And some of uh, so, some of the important things that the pandemic didn't stop us. Uh, for example, uh, the virtuality has helped us to reach a lot of people that it, it is not the same. For example, we have reached like three thousand people in like three years of work, but in five months, thanks to the virtuality, we have. Uh, we have have more than 1,000 participants, so that's really cool for us. We have new publications. In this moment, we have a 34 year old young leaders group, and they have uh, really helpful uh, with all the, all the all the information we want to share with the people. We also have made new alliances. Uh, we also have uh, have made contests, and uh, in this moment, we're working with a set of workshops about different themes. Uh, we want to share with you some of our publications. Uh, like you, you, you can see, they are fun. They try to give information really uh, in a really appealing way to a, a appealing way, so that people can feel connected to them, uh, so they can learn and not only learn or uh, be informed, but also what they can do. And so we gave also options, and we also have made have done contests. I'm sorry. I have this okay. alarm, I'm really so sorry. I think that I my time, <laughs> my I'm time is over. But uh, okay, we. I, I want to finish. We have made some contests. Uh, we also have made uh, these workshops about composting, about sustainable menstruation, uh, about sustainable mobility, about leisure, and some of the events that we have made over uh, these times are a regional forum. We have shared experience with Chile, Peru. Uh, with Me Mexico, we also made the forum that we, these are one of the main activities of, of RC Bogota. And uh, last but not least are like the, the networks that we, we work on. And it's a really great indicator for us because we can see how many people follow, follow us. And sorry, but it's funny. At least, and we can see uh, how many people are following us, how I, they interact, how people, how many people we can reach. And okay, yeah, just to, to end, because we're going to continue working for sustainability. And here you can find our social networks. Uh, like Mar Marcela told you, we have a website. We also have a YouTube channel, a podcast. Everything is in Spanish. We know that, but uh, you're welcome to follow us and to see all the things that we have been doing. Thank the last you. Three years. Gracias. Muy interesante. 
De acuerdo. I, um, muchísimas gracias. And please share all of your social media links in the chat box, too. Um, Perfect. We'll do it. I'm going Thank to you. be moving on to RCE, uh, Peterborough, Kawartha, Halliburton. And we have with us Miss Jane Gray, Miss Dorothy Taylor, and Miss Ashley um, Safar. So would you all like to... Um, uh, oh, actually, I've got your video. I am in charge of that. So I'm right. going to be sharing your video uh, right now. Here it comes. Okay. Thank you. Yes. Here we go. Share computer sound. Kim Smith taught me that yesterday. Okay. And here we go. Okay. Everyone, I'm going to start playing the video. Feel free to interrupt me. I'm turning up my uh, computer volume on the lattice that I can go. And interrupt me if it sounds a little bit quiet or anything. Okay, here we go. In Nindag Nuk, Nimki Kopaneshi Kwandishna Kaz Wapagog Dodem. My name is Dorothy Taylor, and I'm from Curve Lake First Nation. And I introduced myself in, in the, the language of the Mississauga Ojibwe. We are pleased to, to present to you our research from the RCE Kawartha entitled UNESCO Research on Indigenous Education. Our website is at the bottom of this slide, RCE Kawartha, if you want to know more about us. We are going to focus on particularly two programs that we, we believe represent, best represent edu uh, Indigenous-led education. And that is Bishka Program Fleming College, and a braided healing with learning first first nation technical institute i'd like to introduce my fellow presenters this is um ashley safar she's the uh, manager of indigenous student services at fleming college and she she uh, implements the the bishko program and she'll be presenting that uh, part of our research also we have jane gray she is a student at Trent University in, here in Peterborough, Ontario, and uh, a PhD student and a teacher. And she's also the author of this research entitled UNESCO Research on Indigenous Education. Jane. So um, our RC's number one long-term objective has been to recognize the vital importance of Indigenous knowledge systems across curricula. So this uh, research project is building on um, Trent's Channing Wenjack School for Indigenous Studies. They were also a partner in this research. The school has been around for 50 years. It was the first Indigenous Studies department in Canada. It, um, you know, has really led the way in bringing Indigenous pedagogies to the fore, land-based learning, experiential learning, bringing language and culture to programs across the university, including education, environment, and business. And now there's a mandatory course credit in Indigenous studies for all disciplines. Uh, within uh, that department is also Indigenous environmental studies and sciences, which is also the first of its kind in North America. Tracks program for younger students, uh, another first um, out of Trent University. Of course, Fleming College, Indigenous Perspectives and Indigenous Student Services, and we'll hear more about that from Ashley. We have some amazing community organizations, the Sacred Water Circle, working with the land between, and the Water Walkers, um, who are a beautiful organization inspired by Grandmother Josephine Mandamin. Um, we have some unique initiatives with Trent business students engaging with Indigenous knowledges and communities, Kawartha World Issues Center, um, Indigenous Youth Leadership, and just these are just a snapshot of all of the things that are going on to support our number one objective. But the first, of course, we're going to focus on is the Bishka program. Thanks, Jane. Uh, so I'm going to talk a little bit more about the Bishka program. Uh, it's, Bishka is an Anishinaabe Moen for Rise Up. Uh, and it's a program to that supports first year Indigenous students transitioning into Fleming College. So Bishka runs as a peer mentorship program and we really focus on 
um, holistic health and well-being uh, in terms of support uh, to encourage uh, student success in their post-secondary journeys. And so we try to ensure that um, students' emotional, mental, physical, and spiritual needs are met. Um, so the Bishka program specifically is centered around students developing peer relationships um, as the foundation to their post-secondary journey and experience. So it begins with an orientation uh, just before school starts, um, which provides some leadership opportunities for the peer mentors, uh, as well as an opportunity for new students to learn about supports and resources and really been, build that foundational knowledge of um, Ngojuanong and the new area that they're, they're now in. Um, so we accomplished this by culturally centered workshops and programming, which includes visits from local elders uh, and traditional knowledge holders. And that continues throughout the academic year. And so students, new students are continuously supported by staff in Indigenous student services, as well as the student peer mentors uh, as they experience their first year in post-secondary education. So some of the outcomes, uh, the effectiveness and outcomes of the Bishka program is that uh, we've seen 100% retention rates for students who participate in the program, as well as 100% graduation rates for students participating. Um, there's opportunities for development of leadership skills. Uh, many mentors actually go on to, um, sorry, many mentees actually go on to become mentors uh, and they speak to their experience uh, and what it meant to them in their transition to post-secondary. And so seeing them come full circle uh, and then uh, want to be mentors and leaders in the Fleming community uh, is really, really great to be able to see firsthand. Um, there's also an engagement with Indigenous teachings. Um, this helps to ensure students have a deeper understanding of uh, the natural world cultural history, perspectives, um, as well as a better understanding of sustainability issues. Um, and the focus is locally, but, but does expand because we do have students coming from a variety of communities uh, across the province and sometimes across Canada. Um, many students um, also experience, uh, you know, a strengthening of cultural uh, sustainability and knowledge. Uh, many students coming to post-secondary are often in a transition time in their lives where they're, they're learning more about their cultural identities. And it's a really great opportunity for students to start that process. Um, they, they tend to share their experiences and understanding with their family and friends uh, and peers as well. Um, so it creates that growth, uh, growth mindset and opening of perspectives and understandings in the community um, as a whole. Um, and in a variety of communities based on where that student is coming from. Uh, and then there's that achievement of a community within a community. So we like to think of ourselves as a community at Fleming as a whole, as being an inclusive environment uh, to support all students. And the Bishka program really creates that smaller community within that larger community. And so I just wanted to end with a, a quick quote um, from one of the mentees in the program. And so he explains, he explains it as a, um, giving a sense of being in a family. It really gives you a sense that you're a part of something bigger. And so that was really impactful to hear students say that of their experience. Um, and and he had also said that, um, that they, he felt he had radical acceptance there and that there wasn't judgment. It was a place where he could all be um, himself, uh, a place that would accept you for who you are. And so it's just amazing to see those outcomes um, you know, both in the statistics of how, you know, the success of the program, but also students' experiences from that, um, the other side um, of their being. And so again, bringing it back to that emotional, mental, physical, and spiritual self. Um, yeah, so I'm glad I was able to, to share some of that with you and uh, we'll pass it back to Jane. Well, the other um, partner in, in this research project was the First Nations Technical Institute and a really unique um, approach to learning, braided healing with learning that, that builds on or picks up on that holistic approach to learning. Um, FNTI uh, works directly with communities to identify uh, employment needs. And so as one of their vice presidents, Adam Hopkins says, they'll go into a community and they might say, you know, we need 15 social workers. And so they go right within the community to train people. And the way they do it is with intensive week-long sessions that are offered once per month over a two-year period. And that allows students to stay right within their communities, 
to maintain their family responsibilities, their community responsibilities, and that has a particular benefit for women who often can't leave their communities to go to school. And the really amazing part of it, the braided healing with learning, brings elders, um, instructors, and students success workers all together within the classroom to support that personal growth of the student, that holistic well-being that Ashley talked about. Um, and that is really a key to their academic success. So they really bring together Western curriculum with Indigenous teachings. And as a result, they have a 94 to 96% graduation rate. And I too would like to just offer a quote from one of the students, Kristen, who said, it's incorporating learning in a circle. It's incorporating ceremony to get you in the mindset of learning. It's incorporating all this knowledge, not just from the instructor, but also ancestral knowledge. And um, uh, one of the people who's had a vast experience with all three institutions, Dan Longboat, wanted us to emphasize that it's these three institutions, the college, the institute, and the university together that provide amazing holistic pathways, not just for Indigenous students, but for all students. And so Elder Dorothy is going to close with a quote from, from Professor Longbrook that sums up a lot of this research. Right, yes. And as you can, uh, as you have seen demonstrated that it's Indigenous-led culturally significant um, components in a, in, a, in a successful education that we have, we have witnessed in those two amazing programs. So Dan Longboat is the uh, um, director of the Indigenous, Indigenous Envi Environmental Studies Program at Trent University. And he's, he's highly regarded elder and faith keeper. So his quote goes, um, you know, when you are training one person, they are connected to a family, connected to an extended family, connected to a community, connected to a nation. That's a smart investment. By looking at the elements of education, you're never going to get to have a fully functional citizen within the nation until you ad address the necessary part of healing. Our history with the West has created tremendous intergenerational trauma that Indigenous learners are carrying today. You can't just provide them with a few books and read, and read an essay to write. It's much deeper than that. That's where the cultural-based education comes in, and that's the foundation for change. The introduction of that within Indigenous pedagogy is life-changing for all learners, be they Indigenous or not. Uh, miigwech, miigwech Kinawag uh, for uh, listening to our presentation today. And we just wanted to put this next uh, slide up because it gives, uh, it's a, just an outline of the credits of who uh, we had worked together with on this. Uh, research project, and we like to say miigwech Thank very you. much. Uh, miigwech. Thank you so much. Um, you know, Jane, Dorothy, and Ashley, um, we're actually going to be taking a five-minute break right now. Uh, we'll be coming back at 724, and Roberta will be introducing our next speaker. Um, but Jane, Dorothy, and Ashley, if you'd like to say a few words while everybody's taking their break, feel free to go ahead. Uh, I'll see everybody at 724. So feel free to stretch your legs or anything, arms, whatever. Yeah. And I'll also be here during the break. I'm not going anywhere. So. And also, I'd like to say um, also um, thank you so much for Dr. Chris, to Dr. Chris Egan and Dr. Martin Perryboom from Salisbury University's Fulton School of uh, Liberal Arts for joining us tonight. So thank you. Hi, Dorothy. Hi. <laughs> um, there was a question in the comments that asked if we could get our video translated somehow into Spanish, I guess. Yeah, if that's, I don't know if we could do that possibly. Jane or Ashley. We, 
We could do it at RC yeah. Salisbury if you want. Yeah. Oh, yeah. really? Yeah. That would be awesome. Yep. I'm a Brittany's unofficial translator. Hi. <laughs> How are you? Good, thanks. <laughs> we can do Italian, English, Spanish, Portuguese. I speak Quechua. Uh, oh, you do? We, wow, that's amazing. We, we can do French. What else, Brian? Uh, Hebrew, Aramaic, Arabic. Uh -huh. A little bit Korean, of Hindi. Korean, Japanese. Well, that's amazing. Well, maybe if uh, the uh, the the uh, RCEs from South America may may want a copy of our video, they're welcome to it, I would think, and uh, in translate it if at all possible. It's so well done. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Well, kudos goes to Ashley. Uh, who's on our team here and she's with the Vishka program. She's, she's done the bulk of the work and uh, with Jane to doing the research, really. Cool. Yeah, we're partnering with a variety of Native American communities in, in the greater Portland region. So I, I definitely want to share it I with them. I see. Okay, yeah. fabulous. Yeah. Go ahead. <laughs> if you want to send your, um, our, if you want a copy of our, our, our video um, or maybe a contact, you know, it would be good to, um, yeah, okay. maybe uh, with um, Ashley Safar or Jane, Jane Gray of our RCE. Cool. Also, hi, Dr. Thomas Boudreau. Hi, Dr. Jacques Coco. Hi, Dr. Keitha. Thank you so much for joining us. Um. <clears throat> Excuse me. All the presentations are together in a drive, and I'll get you access to it so you can see that one, okay? Dr. Boudreau, I'm talking to you. That Tom. Okay? Tom, we got the same thing as last night. I'm reading your lips. <laughs> yeah. I'm trying to type a message to Brittany to see if we can get a copy of the last presentation plus yeah. the video. And I was giving my greetings to the clan mother as well and to yeah. thank her for the presentation. I'll give it From our theater call. folks, the suggestion that Congrats. this chapter of our memoirs will be entitled, You're Still on Mute. <laughs> <laughs> you clearly best, have uh, an awesome team at RCE Salisbury. <laughs> Huge congrats to all of you for hosting and doing such a good job. Obviously, there's lots and lots of stories, and it's hard to keep it within our time frames, but yeah. huge props to you. <laughs> I miss you, Kim. Well, and, and I'd this like last to. Last session um, made me homesick for my native Ontario. Cheers. Ah, ah. I'd also like to explain to Oriana that uh, Roberto was like that to me, and, and I was his professor. So he's he's tough even on his professors. Roberto, we got to talk after this. No, oh, it's been a while, Tom. Hope you're doing well. That's what I mean. It's been too long. I know. Roberto, you catch up. You're still a tough timekeeper, I can see. I know. No, he's got to keep on it, man. Hey. hey. He kept on me, yeah, so. Good job. You ready to go? Yep, nine or 724. Roberto, would you like to do the first introduction? Oh, uh, yeah. Up next, we have R.C. Lima Callao, and uh, we will have uh, Teresa. Teresa, are you there? She must still be on break. Let me double check. If not, we can just move on to the next presentation, come back to Teresa. It says Teresa, Teresa's here. Teresa, can you hear us? Good afternoon, dear friend <gasps> of RC South America. I am glad um, to see you fine. Uh, greetings for RC Lima Callao uh, from Peru. My presentation is uh, written in English. I am speak in Spanish.
Un aspecto muy importante para lograr eh, una educación para el desarrollo sostenible es eh, pensar cómo pensamos el mundo. Uno de los grandes problemas para lograr la sostenibilidad viene de los modelos mentales con los cuales nosotros eh, interpretamos la realidad actuamos en ella e interactuamos a nivel individual, a nivel social y en nuestra relación con la naturaleza. La separación de la educación y las experiencias de vida fue un reto en el siglo XX. Y sigue siendo, pero en el siglo XXI, con la situación que estamos viviendo, es una necesidad fundamental. Necesitamos entender la condición humana, necesitamos una identidad con los seres humanos y una identidad con la tierra para la vida sostenible. Necesitamos una metamorfosis de la conciencia para la sostenibilidad. Nosotros en el RC Lima Callao trabajamos varias líneas. Trabajamos por los residuos sólidos, por mejorar la percepción del cambio climático. Estamos articulados en la red de universidades eh, del Ministerio del Ambiente. Pero tenemos dos líneas epistémicas de trabajo en cuanto al conocimiento. Trabajamos articulando el conocimiento occidental, que nos ha traído muchas cosas buenas, pero hay muchas que replantear, y el conocimiento intercultural, el conocimiento de las comunidades nativas, de las comunidades indígenas, tal como manifestó la colega que nos había anticipado. En Perú hemos enfrentado el problema de la pandemia muy fuertemente. Y eso es porque son sociedades que no están preparadas para enfrentar las incertidumbres y las emergencias. Al inicio de la pandemia, Perú tomó buenas decisiones en cuanto a tratar de evitar las aglomeraciones sociales porque no había una sostenibilidad en los hospitales. Sin embargo, la informalidad de la vida, la falta de trabajo, eh, emergieron una serie de problemas, cerca de 80.000 muertos y lo que se llamó el éxodo del hambre, porque al desaparecer muchas organizaciones que daban trabajo diariamente en la ciudad de Lima, cantidades de gente no tenían cómo sobrevivir. Y entonces estas comunidades giraron hacia sus orígenes, se fueron hacia las comunidades internas hacia sus pueblos donde estaban seguros que los iban a recibir. Edgar Morin, en el marco de, del fin de siglo, del siglo XX, a pedido de la UNESCO, entre otros científicos, presentaron este libro que se llama Los siete saberes de la educación del futuro donde fundamentalmente hace un llamado a la conciencia para trabajar desde la educación ciertos valores que puedan servir de marcos 
para interpretar la realidad, para interpretarnos y para interactuar en conjunto. Hay que revisar lo que entendemos por conocimientos pertinentes, la ceguera del conocimiento, el, la condición humana, la ética del género humano, enseñar la comprensión. Son aspectos fundamentales que a la luz de lo que está viviendo la humanidad con esta pandemia de características globales, son fundamentales. En, en, junto a estos valores que nos tienen que servir para hacer una metamorfosis de la conciencia, también están los valores propios que hay en nuestras sociedades, que son los conocimientos interculturales. ¿no? El ser humano es un ser multidimensional, biológico, físico, social, afectivo. ¿no? Entonces nuestra racionalidad está más en, el fun en función del tener que del ser. Y desde la educación para el desarrollo sostenible tenemos que reivindicar esta perspectiva. Es necesario promover una transformación individual, replantear nuestra forma de ver el mundo como individuos, una metamorfosis social y una metamorfosis en nuestra relación con la naturaleza. En este sentido, nosotros venimos articulando diversas tradiciones de los saberes. Nosotros en, tenemos una, eh, un legado muy hermoso de la civilización andino-amazónica que se basa en las comunidades indígenas, en la reciprocidad, en la ayuda mutua, en la solidaridad, en la protección de la familia y son valores fundamentales. Imagínense toda la gente que en Lima se vio sin trabajo inmediatamente pensó que podían, como ellos dicen, podían ser abrigados por sus familias en sus comunidades. Era el único lugar que les quedaba. Por eso iniciaron marchas. Se fueron a pie hacia sus lugares de orígenes. ¿no? Y es por esa eh, costumbre de la ayuda mutua, de enfrentar juntos las incertidumbres que hemos perdido en las ciudades. Porque es muy difícil que en una ciudad uno pueda de pronto recibir otra familia en su casa, casi imposible. ¿no? Pero en las comunidades sí, porque ellos tienen otra forma de interrelacionarse. Aquí vemos nosotros, para enfrentar el tema de la alimentación, que es un problema muy grave en Perú, con el 50% de desnutrición infantil, ¿no? y siendo el Perú uno de los países con mayor... Eh, biodiversidad del mundo. Entonces hay un trastocamiento en los valores alimenticios que es importante reivindicar. Nosotros tenemos un proyecto sobre biodiversidad y nutrición en comunidades indígenas que estamos valorizando eh, los saberes y los valores de apreciación de la alimentación. Trabajamos con un equipo en la universidad y vamos hacia las comunidades. ¿no? Y también trabajamos con, eh, con, eh, desde los marcos de la complejidad, eh, trabajamos temas eh, como modelación para agentes, estamos trabajando eh, cómo darle un marco este, también científico-técnico ¿no? y cómo promover el diálogo de saberes entre los conocimientos de los técnicos y los conocimientos de los indígenas ¿no? En, el, en, el, en el manejo de la agricultura, en el manejo del agua, en el manejo del bosque. Es la única forma con la cual se puede revertir el cambio climático en los Andes del Perú. Escuchando a las comunidades tradicionales que han criado por miles de años, porque ellos llaman criar la biodiversidad, criar la biodiversidad. Ellos no siembran, sino crían. Es una relación mutua de reciprocidad. En la vida ellos conciben, todo da y todo recibe. Disculpe, pero necesito parar. Pero tu presentación fue muy buena, muy buena.
Gracias. Tenemos, por ejemplo, varios ejemplos que voy a pasar rápidamente por el tiempo. Trabajamos por eh, la sostenibilidad en el uso de la energía. Trabajamos con los estudiantes estos saberes, los saberes interculturales y los saberes básicos de la ética humana. Tenemos un concurso, hemos, hemos eh, sido invitados para trabajar en el marco de un proyecto que lanzó este UNESCO Montevideo y estamos trabajando con ellos también en un concurso que fue nacional y ahora se ve un poco más internacional. Tenemos la reunión de Jóvenes por la Vida, que algunos colegas han compartido cuando hemos hecho la reunión en Perú. Tenemos también el... Eh, bueno, trabajamos todas eh, estas actividades, están en el marco de los Objetivos de Desarrollo Sostenible y la Agenda de Educación 2030. Perú es un país que tiene una amenaza de sismos de alto impacto por las condiciones de eh, la placa de Nazca y trabajamos nosotros muy, muy en, en nexo con los organismos del Estado, con los jóvenes de las universidades y los, eh, las organizaciones civiles para preparar a la gente en lo que significaría enfrentar esta otra emergencia que nos acudiría frente a la pandemia y que ojalá no se dé, pero tenemos que tener una cultura de prevención. Bueno, en el marco de, bueno, hemos convocado a, a cómics, a infografías, a un lenguaje mucho más accesible a la comunidad. En el marco de la pandemia hemos trabajado este, varias, eh, hemos llamado los diálogos por la vida para orientar a la comunidad este, universitaria, a la comunidad en general, sobre eh, cómo enfrentar esta pandemia que ha sido tan dura en el país y sobre todo eh, cómo revalorar, porque miren, en el Perú hay un sector de pobreza fuerte a pesar del crecimiento del país, que están sobreviviendo porque tienen los valores andino-amazónicos, las ollas comunes, la ayuda mutua, ¿no? lo que ellos este, llaman las micunas, ¿no? que son las comidas colectivas, que han podido paliar el hambre y la necesidad en estos momentos tan duros de restricción de la economía, de pérdidas de trabajo, y que realmente ayudan mucho a, a poder este, reivindicar el amor, la justicia social, la equidad y la razón de ser, de estar en el mundo de una manera más humana. Gracias, doctor, pero, pero necesito uh, sí, parar. Thank you very much. Uh, up next, we have R.C. Shenandoah, and we're going to be hearing from Dr. Steve Crondit. Great. Hi, everyone. Let me share my screen here as well. Excellent. Thank you uh, so much, RCE Salisbury, for hosting this and pulling this together. And these meetings have been so influential to us and so helpful. And so uh, it's great to see so many of you and, and, uh, and reconnect, even if it is virtual. So a little, just I want to give a uh, just a brief update of, of where we are and continue to take inspiration from uh, the other presenters tonight and last night. Very, very uh, inspiring. Uh, the Shenandoah Valley is uh, a region in Virginia and West Virginia in the mid-Atlantic portion of the United States. And uh, we're both a geologic region, but we're also a cultural region. And we're also part of a larger watershed as well. And so as we talk about who we are, uh, we need to make sure we also acknowledge uh, that everything about who we are is connected to the land. And uh, the land that, um, that we inherited um, is land that uh, was uh, originally indigenously uh, uh, habited by um, both the uh, Suen, the Algonquian, and the uh, Iroquoian uh, peoples. And, um, and James Madison University, which is one of the hosts of our uh, RCE, was named after no other than James Madison, who uh, was considered the founder of the Constitution in the United States and also owned uh, slaves and um, enslaved people. And, um, and we need to make sure that when we talk about our RCE, that we also acknowledge this uh, fractured and, and uh, problematic 
uh, history as well. So I wanted to make sure before I went forward in talking about our region that we acknowledge the, uh, the, the history of this region and where we are today. Uh, so as I mentioned, uh, this, uh, this partnership uh, is in the uh, Chesapeake Bay watershed and um, that's uh, just a remarkable uh, watershed. And uh, so I wanted to at least acknowledge um, that as well. We're about these, uh, trying to leverage the strengths of five regional colleges and universities to address community priorities. And I think that's one of our strengths and one of our biggest challenges. And so like Puerto Rico talked about last night, if we wanna be honest about and be vulnerable about our, our successes and some of our challenges. Uh, we have had a number of challenges over the year, really kind of getting started and finding our feet, so to speak. And, um, and we continue to try to find our way forward. Uh, this last year, we had some great conversations with Kim Smith from Portland, who was uh, very helpful to so many of us. And Kim uh, has been helpful to us as well in finding our way. Uh, this is just a little bit about our region. And um, while we're a primarily rural area, <clears throat> most of the population lives in two uh, metropolitan areas. And uh, these are some images of those two areas as well that makes up about two thirds of the population. So while we are primarily rural, there are these urban uh, centers and, um, and that also speaks to many of the challenges in this area around things like poverty, rural poverty, transportation, and being uh, able to access critical services are very challenging for people if they don't already have transportation, um, they don't already have childcare. There are many people that have jobs but don't make enough money to actually um, have a decent quality of life. And so that's a primary issue in this region. Uh, the five partners that I mentioned, the higher education partners are photographed here, so you can, you can see them. It's a mix of uh, four-year institutions and two-year colleges and public institutions and private institutions in, in our region. Uh, just a, a few things about uh, the, the population that makes up our, our region. Uh, it's, it's much more diverse than most people would think, particularly in the northern part of uh, our region in Harrisonburg. Uh, it's a refugee resettlement area, so there are immigrant refugees from all over the world. Most recently, there's been a large uh, immigrant group from uh, the Congo. Uh, so um, so it, it's a uh, racially and ethnically diverse. Uh, there's also a large population of Old Order Mennonites and that uh, particular religious faith. Uh, there's much more racial diversity in our cities and considerably less in our county. So there's a, these massive political divides often between the cities and the counties that lead to um, stress and division. And then there's also um, an element that, uh, that has a lot of skepticism about the United Nations. And so that sometimes uh, undermines some of our thinking about how do we talk about um, education for sustainable development? How do we talk about the sustainable development goals? Uh, so what we want to do just in the last couple of minutes is, is just really briefly just mention that um, there's lots of um, opportunities and capacity here, but that we're struggling with how do we make sure we do our work in a way that really addresses the sustainable development goals. So we're constantly rethinking our structure that brings in the voices of the community, that brings in the voices of higher education, that connects to these larger SDGs. And uh, we're, we're, we're getting closer, we're not there, but we're constantly trying to change that structure. So we're always adopting our bylaws and our, um, and then actually who sits around the table to try to, to do a better job of, of, like, of, of doing the work. Um, so some one of the unique things about our area is that we have this amazing uh, local food initiative. One of the ones that's most, most well known is Polyface Farms. Uh, it's an internationally known farm in our area. You may have, if you've, um, seen the, the book Omnivore's Dilemma. It starts off at Polyface Farm. So that's in our region, but there's other examples as well. So there's this rich, rich area of local food that's, that's uh, not only produced, but how it's done sustainably is, is very impressive. Uh, we uh, can success say that we successfully stopped a massive pipeline from being built that was on the books for years. And just this spring uh, or summer, we actually stopped the Atlantic Coast Pipeline from being built. It's a, it's a huge victory. And uh, I think it sends signals really across the globe that as hard as this is, on occasion, it can be done. We can stop uh, multinational corporations from uh, destroying 
uh, this environment. So this was a, a huge success and it was done by grassroots uh, organizations in this area. And that speaks to one more um, asset or capacity in our area, which is just very innovative uh, nonprofits and for-profits that, um, that do some really great work um, in, in this region that it, it, we can't imagine our quality of life without some of these um, innovative organizations. I wanted to make sure I acknowledge them. Uh, the issues that, that we're facing um, are around um, probably all the SDGs, but these are the ones that are often more prominent. So um, you can see those there, climate action, gender equality, life below water, life on land, sustainable communities. And so we have faculty at our various institutions that are working on these issues. And we also have community partners that are doing good work. And what we see as our job is how do we pull all that together? And that's where uh, when, it, when it comes together, um, it's really outstanding. Uh, and when it, when it doesn't, we're kind of left uh, kind of frustrated and uh, trying to figure out how do we make the linkages stronger? How do we leverage all the resources of our higher education partners to address some of these pressing uh, local issues. So um, the one more kind of tension point is that our institutions have made uh, commitments to sustainability. Our higher education institutions have made these commitments. And so we are trying to figure out how to support those institutions. They're all feeling the strain uh, that's even gotten worse during COVID-19 of how do they manage the limited resources that they have. And so things are being cut, um, there are reductions, there are um, austerity programs, and how do they maintain these commitments in this environment? And so we're trying to support that as well as support these larger um, regional efforts. And then uh, just lastly, uh, just some of the challenges that we see in our environment that I think are really not unique uh, to our environment are things like the constant urbanizing and the spread of development into uh, rural areas. Uh, the small family farms are really struggling. Um, the suicide rate amongst dairy farmers continues to rise. Uh, the level of poverty, or it's not always extreme poverty, but the, the terrible decisions that many families have to make between putting food on the table and paying the rent and other uh, decisions like that. So those are economic challenges or social challenges, how to preserve the rural history of the region, while also supporting economic development, uh, cross-cultural competency. And then lastly, there's all kinds of uh, water issues. Stopping the pipeline was a major success, but that doesn't really address all the water issues that were already in existence before the pipeline was proposed. So that just gives a, a flavor of um, what our, um, our RCE has been uh, dealing with and addressing. And thank you for the opportunity to, to share with you all. Thank you much, Steve. That was a great presentation. Hi, everyone. Brittany, back again. I'm going to be introducing our next speaker. Our next speaker is Mr. Richard Stone. He is the CEO of StoryWork International, and he is going to be representing us tonight from RCE Greater Atlanta. Looking forward to your presentation, Richard. Can you, can you hear me okay? Good, and you see the presentation okay? Yep, good. All right, good, thank you. And thanks for giving me some time on the program. Uh, tonight I wanna to talk to you about a program uh, we're gonna offer here in Atlanta and we wanna open it up to the other RCEs. Um, and it's really about uh, developing what I call your story intelligence uh, to become a more effective leader. Um, so uh, let's see if I can get the slide to move here. There we go. Uh, so we're gonna offer uh, right after the first of the year a, a seven week uh, program, a training program for RCE leaders uh, to actually enhance their story intelligence. And I've been working with the Atlanta RCE now for a couple of years. I moved here from Orlando. I've been working with storytelling for a long, long time and have been bringing some of my uh, tools and skills to uh, making them available to the leaders here. Uh, just to give you a little background, I've, I've been writing books. I have a new book out on story intelligence. Uh, that'll be coming out next year and that'll be actually a template for a lot of the curricula that we'll be, that we'll be offering for leaders. So I wanna tell you a little bit about the course and, uh, and if you're interested, uh, if my, I'll, I'll post up my email address. Please write me and we'll get, get you more details. Uh, but we want to make it available. I think we'll have room up to 100 people, um, and I think it'll be something of great value for you. So um, let me talk to you a little. Oops, let's go back one. 
No, no, there we go. No? There we go. So, you know, you all have seen this, but you haven't seen the little, the little icon in, on the far left. When I started looking at the sustainable development goals a few years ago and, uh, and I, some of the other work I've been doing, I felt there was something missing. And the thing that was missing was, was us <laughs> as leaders. Uh, you know, you know, we often talk about all the activity is focused externally about making differences and making impact outside. Uh, but I, we're the instrument for the change. And if we do not develop ourselves and develop our, our, our human spirit, I don't think that we can be as effective as we'd like to be. Um, so I think that we need to look at sustaining the human spirit. And, and that's what I want to talk to you about for a couple minutes right now. Um, oops. So first of all, um, I think what's the problem, we, we know we have lots of problems um, here in the United States. We've had horrendous fires. We've had, I think, four hurricanes that hit the southern Gulf Coast this season. The solutions are out there. We already know what the solutions are. Drawdown, a lot of the work with Drawdown has shown that we have the solutions readily available, but there's a giant gap in, in terms of between inst instituting those. And I think the problem is, is that it's not just with our imagination as leaders, but ha engaging the imagination uh, of our communities. And um, I think that storytelling is the language of the imagination. And, uh, and when we can perfect and develop that capacity, we can become much more effective at actually engaging others. Um, just to give you a little history of some of the ideas behind some of the things that we'll be talking about, everyone's probably familiar with this phrase from Descartes, I think, therefore I am. Uh, he wrote that in the 1600s. Um, and that kind of defined the way we think of ourselves and human, human capacity uh, uh, for a long time. Uh, Carl Linnaeus came along in 1758 and he named us Homo sapiens, and, and which means wise human or thinking human. And it's, it's not surprising because uh, of Descartes' impact. Um, and IQ became really the focus and leaders have been very focused on being logical. And we now know that uh, giving people the scientific evidence for, for climate change and giving them all the, the data does not change people's minds. Uh, in fact, it actually often keeps them ensconced in their, in their perspective. Um, there's been some obviously great work around emotional intelligence. You're all familiar with that. In uh, 1995, Daniel Goleman came out with this concept of emotional intelligence. It was really based on research that was showing that uh, there's a lot more to us than just our thinking. And that uh, to be an effective leader, you have, to, you have to become much more aware and empathic. And I think that with the recent research on, uh, especially the MRI research on the brain, we're now discovering that there's actually another kind of level of intelligence that I think undergirds both IQ and EQ. I call it story intelligence or SQ. And I think we have a penchant for creating a living within stories and that's the defining characteristic of what it means to be a human being. And so we're living in a story right now <laughs> with the environment and with, with the SDGs. And the question is how do we move the rest of the world to, uh, to a better story. Um, and so I would suggest that we, have, we need a better name than Homo sapien, and I, I propose we should be, think of ourselves as Homo norari, as storytelling humans. And when leaders begin to embrace that and really develop that capacity, I think that we can become much more effective at making an impact around the SDGs. So really briefly, here's what the curricula is. I've identified seven powers of story. And we're gonna cover the, these seven powers in, in the curricula. Uh, the first is the power to transport, to take us to other places. You, we've all grown up maybe with that little ditty, you know, the cow jumped over the moon. Um, and, uh, and none of us say, when someone starts telling us the story that the cow jumped over the moon, we, we, we never say, well, wait a second, that couldn't happen, that's not scientifically possible, there's no air up there. We actually say, well, what happened next? So we allow ourselves to go along with the storyteller and, and to be transported to a new place. And this is really the fundamental underlying structure of stories that takes us to other places. And when we learn how to really utilize this, uh, we can become very effective. Uh, the next is the power to communicate. And there's a lot of research that's showing now is that when we're telling a story, actually the mind of the people listening to us entrains to the story. 
and giving information and scientific data that doesn't happen. It looks more like the top two people. But when we're telling a story, suddenly our brains begin to look very similar. So learning how to really uh, utilize this capacity to make a difference and to influence people is really important. Uh, the third is the power to enable learning. And uh, you know, we were just the recent, the other presentation we just saw on, on indigenous learning is so crucial. And I've done a lot of work uh, uh, with a number, number of indigenous teachers here in the United States who have taught me a great deal about the approaches to enabling learning. In fact, they, they don't even have a word for teach. The best uh, translation would be enabler of learning. Uh, so I think that this is a crucial thing that we need to learn how to use as educators uh, is to kindle a flame, not, not to fill the vessel. So how can we actually kindle a flame for change and, and new thinking, especially among young people? The, the uh, fourth power is the power to create meaning. Uh, ikigai is actually Japanese, which is a concept they're using, which is about creating greater meaning and context in our lives. Um, and so I think as leaders, we need to discover what is, what is most meaningful for us and which brings us the most purpose. Uh, the 17 SDGs is overwhelming. Where, where do we want to plant our feet? Where do we want to put our attention and energy? And how does that connect with what our deep calling and purpose is in life? Uh, the sixth or the fifth is the power to transform. And uh, what we'll teach you is how to use stories uh, to actually heal old wounds. <laughs> and to actually open people to new possibilities. Uh, the, seven, the sixth is the power to unite. And we, we're living in a world right now of great polarization. We know that stories can actually create a great deal of disunity, <laughs> can actually separate people. Uh, but power, stories can powerfully bring people together. And we'll, there's a lot of technology with how to do that. Uh, some of the colleagues I've worked with through the years have really developed some very powerful approaches is how do we bring people together around issues of importance. And finally, the, is the power to envision possibilities. And uh, some people would say that storytelling is not so much about retrospective knowledge, but it's about prospective, about looking to the future. So how can we use story to implant in people an idea of possibility, to get them on board with a new story, a new vision for what the future could look like? And you as leaders need to know how to do that and be very effective with that. Um, so proposed dates, we're going to start looking, I think, at January 5th. We'll go once a week for an hour and a half. It'll be workshop format. It won't be me talking so much. It'll be me actually leading you through some of these basic concepts and ideas to engage you. And, um, and here's my, uh, my email address. I'll put it also in the chat. Uh, we may have a couple minutes, Brittany, right now for any questions. I don't know. I think I, I don't know how much time do I have left. Yeah. 30 seconds. 30 seconds. <laughs> Who's got a good question for 30 seconds? Brian, Brian's got one, maybe, I think. I just thought, no? No, I was just saying one minute. She said 30 seconds. Oh, one wondering. minute. Okay, great. <laughs> Brian, now it's already up. <laughs> uh, use up 30 Sorry, seconds, Richard. Brian. <laughs> Thank you, Richard. Well, Thank good. I, I will post up my email address in the, in, the, uh, in the chat. Please write me if you have interest or you know others who might be interested. And as we uh, solidify the plans here in Atlanta uh, for the Atlanta RC, uh, we want to invite all of you to come be a part of the program if you have interest. Thank you. Thank you. Up next, we have a uh, RC British Columbia, and we'll be hearing from our presenters, David and Shannon. Hi there, can you hear me? Uh, yes. Great. Um, so I got to find a way to share my screen here. Um, Sorry, uh, um, there's a green button that says share screen when you uh, pop up the, the tab there. I see that. So green, share screen. There we go. And now I got to find what I wanted to share. That's how we roll in Canada. Mm -hmm. Yep. I'm doing this from a laptop, which is part of the problem. So I've got to find so many windows to open up here. Uh, I'm not finding my window here. 
Brittany, do you have it? Here we go. Let's try this. That coming up now? I have it too, David, if you want me to bring it up. It's whatever. Is it there? No, it's not coming up. Did you hit a share screen? And then there'll be like a, li a lot of like little boxes should pop up. If not, Brittany can probably pull it up. I Maybe we should just have Brittany do that if that's possible. Yeah. David, that way. Brittany, can you pull it up, please? Yep. It's, it says loading. Here we go, everybody. All right. And David, just tell me when you want me to change slides and everything. Sure. Now I'm going to try to come back to the Zoom screen so I can see you all. There we go. There we go. Okay, okay. so um, go Shannon, ahead, Shannon is here with me. So Shannon, why don't you introduce oh. yourself first and then I'll jump in. Certainly. Uh, my name is Dr. Shannon Letty. I am originally from Treaty 6 territory in Saskatoon, Saskatchewan, and I have been living on the ancestral territory of the Musqueam people since 1994 here in Vancouver, British Columbia. And I wanted to um, thank uh, the other presenter that I heard today, and, and there were probably more, but I didn't catch it all, for making these territorial acknowledgements, because it's really important if we're learning from the land to remember that the land has a very storied history that it connects long before colonization and the formation of our country. So hello from Vancouver, British Columbia. I'm uh, David Zanfleet. I'm at Simon Fraser University. Um, and I'm actually, uh, I actually really identified with the Kawartha's uh, Halliburton RCE. Thank you to that group for presenting because I think we're on a similar topic. And I'm originally from uh, Toronto, Ontario area, um, you know, traditional territory of Anishinaabeg and Mississauga. I'm currently living in Stolo territory in Chilliwack, uh, BC. Um, and, um, I think, you know, both Shannon and I are the co-directors of RCE British Columbia, which is kind of an unfortunate name for our topic. We should rename, we should rename our province. What do you think? Shannon, should we get on that? Yeah. Yep, sure, why not? Yeah, we're neither British nor Colombian, so there you go. But um, um, our presentation is about, um, I think, decolonizing education and also bringing this context to the governance of our own RCE here in BC. Um, I, I would like to speak first a little bit. I mean, this first, uh, uh, my first exposure to Indigenous knowledge, I met Gregory Kahede a couple of times through my work with NITAP out of UBC, where I know Shannon is now working. And it was really transformative for me as a, as a Western trained scientist, um, I had lived in a number of indigenous communities in the Yukon and in British Columbia, and uh, this really resonated with me and informed my work in the science education and ecological education field from the very beginning. Uh, I'll let Shannon speak to the other references there. Thank you, David. I think we just wanted to get to uh the, the thinking, asking people to think about the fact that in that environmental education has deep, deep connections um, to indigenous education. So the ideas of sustainability that we bring into this discourse now, many of them have their roots in historic discourses that only are recently coming to light in the kind of published forms that we can all have access to. But I think earlier notions of stewardship that have been brought forward for many generations past are a really important consideration as we work out how to do this work together better now. Great. Okay. And Brittany, yes, that's great. So I think one of these notions um, that, you know, I think is coming to the fore uh, has been written, I think it's a Mi'kmaq principle of two-eyed seeing, but it was echoed in some earlier work, which uh, was sometimes referred to as sort of bicultural science education in this idea of border crossing. You know, so rather than looking at science or ecological knowledge as a purely Western idea, um, sort of keeping that, but also acknowledging that indigenous knowledge and indigenous worldview uh, could contribute. And it's a kind of like the notion, you know, 
if you're if you have any science training you realize the fact that we have two eyes allows us a better depth perception and then if you cover one eye or the other eye you're actually not seeing things as clearly so i think that's a really powerful metaphor go shannon you you talk about stratigraphy I'll talk about stratigraphy. Oh, we, we could have probably put that text a little darker, but that's okay. So just getting back to the idea that I spoke about at the beginning, that we live on storied land. And when we consider the places that we are, we often, often only consider them in our present context. Maybe if we've lived in the same place for a number of generations, we have some stories that, that go back. But I think it's important to think about how far back the stories go. They go beyond, uh, especially for those of us who are newer to the Americas, um, they go beyond the histories of our arrivals and our families' arrivals. And when we start to think about the land as previously occupied, and when we start to look for evidence of those people still existing on the lands that we occupy, then we get a much better understanding of what is at stake in preserving what we've got. Um, and this idea of colonial stratigraphy, I think, is an, an interesting way to conceive of that. I just wanted to ask along with the last slide um, in the way of two-eyed seeing that bringing indigenous voices who are writing about sustainability education environmental education and land-based education is a way to do this work without having to take it all on yourselves it allows us to be co-learners with our students yeah um, just to add maybe to that last slide my own thought there you know one of the one of the big things we're talking about in curriculum reform right now in British Columbia and other places is this notion of place-based education. And, you know, I think this idea of colonial stratigraphy takes that and deepens it. So, you know, sort of, I'm sorry, that's my dog barking in the background. She, she had to say something. Um, but um, it's this notion of sort of taking taking place uh, very seriously um, and looking back at all of the all of the timeline I guess as part of it sorry I'm very distracted by my dog so pull it over to you Shannon Sure. Uh, we just, the last couple of slides are about a few strategies that we've used within our work together, mostly within teacher education and graduate programs for in service teachers. And we often turn to doing circle work, sharing circles, uh, storytelling circles as a way of democratizing the classroom, decentering the power of the teacher to uh, create circumstances in which we can collaboratively co construct knowledge and in which everyone has an equal stake in the learning that's going on. And that's a really important part of the work that we do too, is it decolonizing schooling situations. Um, I can speak to this a little bit. One of the other presenters was talking about story. And I think this really kind of speaks to another pathway into how we construct knowledge, you know, this sort of idea of left brain versus right brain. Um, and I have to, you know, I have to come clean here. I'm a scientist by training and uh, I'm having to work really hard to reclaim this part of my practice, this notion of aesthetics. And even if you're a science educator, I think this is a very big opportunity uh, for us as another way in uh, to learning about place and environment and social issues. Uh, because not everyone comes at this from a kind of logical, uh, cognitive place. And even uh, I had the uh, opportunity to interview David Suzuki a few years ago, and he admitted, he said that actually he became a scientist, but he, be, he fell in love with the environment before he became a scientist. So it's like we protect what we love, and maybe uh, rather than going directly into the science of things, we need to start with aesthetics. I am a science teacher. No, I'm not. I'm an art teacher. I don't even know what I teach. It's five o'clock here. Um, I am an art teacher. And so this is another aspect of, of what I want to bring to our practices in sustainability and environmental learning is just the opportunity to play, to do something with our hands while we're talking about rigorous uh, content from the articles and readings for class. I think that is a more human way of learning together and a more traditional way of learning together. We would often have been gathered around 
peeling potatoes, making things, digging things, what have you. So this is a way of bringing that practice into a classroom. And I think it does something quite magical in terms of freeing our minds to open us to the subject at hand. I think we just have one more slide. I'm conscious of time as well. Um, yeah, there you go. And that's just sort of our summary. The notion of two-eyed seeing, thank to, thanks to those in the text who pointed out that that is Thomas and Ardina Marshall, uh, who are Mi'kmaq. Um, and I think we've mostly touched on these points, but really relationships for me are the most important part of learning with the land, learning in land-based ways and learning in ways that honor indigenous ways of knowing and indigenous pedagogies that can help support us all to improve our collective well-being. I'm muted, sorry. Thanks, Shannon. Thanks, uh, thanks David. Uh, all right. Thanks. Yeah, nice was, closer. And hi to your dog, David. He obviously <laughs> liked the presentation, or she, because they were barking. Um, <laughs> So tonight, uh, we're going to conclude the RCE presentations with actually our RCE presentation over here at RCE Salisbury, and I am in the process of pulling it up right now. Sorry, everybody. Brian and Roberto, feel free to get it up if you can get it up before me, but I've got it. It's loading right now. Yeah, go ahead. All right, go ahead. here we go. Don't worry, Bernie. I'm keeping time on you, too. Oh, shoot. <laughs> <laughs> you trained them too well. <laughs> All right, hey, while it's coming up, uh, we should say that we're out on a peninsula and uh, it's had people on this peninsula for thousands of years and we're in Assateek and Piscataway and, and Anghunk oh. and uh, Territory. And, and so in, in light of Steve and <clears throat> Shannon, um, this, is, this is the neighborhood we reside in at Salisbury University. And in fact, you can see the, Steve, does that look familiar, that watershed? <laughs> um, Brian, want me to move on? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, that's, uh, this, I, I want to, uh, <clears throat> the RCE Salisbury is housed in the Bosman Center for Conflict Resolution. It's named after Phil Bosman, <clears throat> who was a professor here. He passed away about 13 years ago. And he went to school with Martin Luther King, and when he was in the Peace Corps way back in the day, uh, one of the guys who saved his life was Albert Schweitzer. So he brought a lot of interesting life experience to the center, <clears throat> and we renamed it for him in 2012. And I just, the reason we have these pictures rather than, you know, research and all that kind of stuff is stories tell, uh, pictures tell stories. But the one on the left, in the very back, you can see a guy in a statue sitting cross-legged, and that's Mohandas Gandhi, Muhammad Gandhi. And his grandson is the guy in the foreground on the right with the glasses. That's Arun, and Arun spent time to live with him in uh, the Sabramati Ashram, and, and Arun's been here in the center with us for uh, 21 years. And he's sort of like the crown jewel. He's the, the spiritual guide, even though we do all sorts of, you know, <laughs> GIS, uh, arbitration, that kind of stuff. When it comes down to the end of the day, he's he's the the guiding person. Brent, you want to take the next one? Yep. Sorry, everybody. I'm on a very sensitive computer. Um, so uh, our RC location is actually located out of the Bosman Center for Conflict Resolution. Um, but Brian and I, we also teach within the Department of Conflict Analysis and Dispute Resolution here at Salisbury. I have like 250 students this semester and I always tell my students it's a really great degree because CATER or that's our acronym, Conflict Analysis and Dispute Resolution, it's like a condiment. It goes with everything. Like, and it's also really good job security because if you study conflict, you're gonna have a job. There's conflict everywhere. So um, I actually am a graduate from the, the our, our CATER department over here at Salisbury University and now I'm very fortunate to be teaching with them right now. Um, and we have, you know, with us in our department, we have Dr. Brian Polkinghorn, who I co-direct this RC location with, with. Huge shout out to Dr. Keitha, Dr. Vita Suzuki, uh, Alexander Gentamartin, Dr. Jacques Coco, Dr. Thomas Boudreau, Ambassador Becker for all joining us and for, you know, being um, leaders for us in the department and also helping our RC location, recruiting students for tonight. So thank you so much. 
our department offers, um, you can get a minor degree, you can get a bachelor's degree, you can get a master's degree, or you can come work with us at RCE Salisbury. You have Dr. Jaco Kokori here on the right, here's Tom, and here is all of our wonderful faculty, and this is a guest speaker right here in the middle. So I'm gonna move on. Uh, Brian or Roberto, would you like to take yeah, the next one? Yeah, I'll take this one and Roberto can have the next one, but I, I do wanna say that the Bosterman Center has been in and on the campus of Salisbury University for 28 years. And when it comes to RCE, it's our the biggest partner and the center is a teaching hospital and all the presentations today and yesterday with student involvement. Uh, I hope you like this because we have 28 fellows and this is the sort of the, the top rank here. We so we have uh, people in there's the countries they're in. So Dr. Rana is in Nepal and he's working on eight and six um, SGDs. And then Kasturi Gandhi is in India and her, her background and the work she's doing is on four, six and 13. And, Odion is with us tonight, uh, and he's doing meta, meta mining research with us, and Ilan Bas, Ilan is down on the uh, left corner there. He's a, a UK citizen, but he's lived in China for about, I don't know, 10 years, and he's doing research in China with us. And then Amr uh, is Pakistani, and he's been, he's, he's a graduate of Salisbury University, as is Odie, and then uh, finally, Peter Kelly, he was my research assistant back in the 90s at Queen's University of Belfast, and he's our doctoral research fellow, and he's at the Carter School for Peace and Conflict Resolution at George Mason University. So we have students doing a, a ton of different stuff. Hey, Roberto, you want to do this slide? <laughs> yeah, I'll do it. Uh, so my name is Roberto, and uh, right now I'm going to talk about a little bit about the graduate fellows uh, that had a... Uh, they had a part in uh, setting up this big summit for everybody. Um, as you know me, Arno, uh, we have Arno Guignon. He's a UNESCO UNITAR fellow. He's from France. We have someone from Italy, Francesca Velasca. Over here, we have Travis Sterling with the Stanley Cup and Hannah Prouse. And here are some of uh, some more of our research fellow. We have a lot. Uh, Jessica Pierce, she actually just recently won the Goldwater Scholar. So uh, congratulations to her. Uh, we also have a bay over here, the right hand side. Uh, we have Evan Polkinghorn uh, over here. He's a UN Millennium Fellow and Nathaniel Sampson, and he's also a research fellow. And if you guys wanna take this one. Yeah, I'll say this. Each one of those students and postdocs you've seen are doing research projects here or overseas, but the, as we move our way back into the university and look at the undergraduate students, their projects are all centered around here. <clears throat> and these are our uh, Millennium Fellows. We had some Millennium Fellows on last night, especially from uh, RCE Atlanta. And, and uh, a lot of them are with uh, health and well-being because we have several pre-med students here. We've got folks that are doing stuff on access to education, um, we have folks that are working with immigrant populations here on the shore. It's uh, everything they're doing is really exciting and would love to be able to take a couple of them tell you about them, but uh, we can't. <laughs> but we're fortunate enough to be hooked up and be designated a UN Millennium Campus. And so this helps us with the Millennium Fellowship and all the good work that these folks are doing. Oh, uh, you, who wants to take this one? <laughs> you can Brian okay we're also working on uh, Millennium uh, Youth and we want to start young <clears throat> and uh, this this little guy here uh, when the outbreak hit decided he wanted to do something uh, different and not sit <clears throat> and watch TV or whatever and got into all sorts of volunteering and um, last weekend he uh, finished his 93rd night camping out and he's learned how to cook over a fire. He's taught kids safe, uh, first aid <clears throat> and um, how to probably use uh, all sorts of uh, knives and hatchets and all those sorts of things. And, and <clears throat> that's the kind of thing, if we're gonna start young, uh, get them on you know, sustainable living and things that we used to do when I was my age, before they had all this stuff you guys do nowadays, <clears throat> get them back to that and appreciating everything about our environment and nature. And, and you know, 
who knows, maybe, maybe these folks are going to change the world for us. Brian, can I say one more thing really quickly? Yeah. Um, we also have a special guest on our call tonight, uh, Miss Krista Peak. Uh, she's also part of our RC Salisbury location. And Krista, can you hear me? Krista and I Hi. actually, my background is working with like child soldiers, human trafficking victim, a lot of restorative justice, uh, working with local communities, uh, even working with the United Nations. That's my background. And um, when I came over here and, you know, wanted to work on RC Salisbury with Brian, Brian, uh, and I have been supporting Krista in a lot of her work, and she's been doing a lot of things through our RCE. But Krista, do you want to throw in really quickly, like what you've been doing through our RCE, through at Choices Academy and everything? Sure. So um, through the R, I, through the RCE, I have been um, and with Brittany, um, we were able to hook up with our local um, board of education here in Wicomico County. And um, after going back and forth with them for about a month or so, they end up placing us in um, a school or the alternative school here in Wicomico County called Choices. Um, these students come that we worked with primarily were middle school students, um, but within this academy, um, they also had high school students. They no longer housed elementary school students in this building. Um, but we primarily worked with the middle school students. These students ranged anywhere from 10 to about 14 years old, um, predominantly male. 90% of um, the student population that we worked with um, had um, tracking devices on, 100% of them have been through the local um, court system and were either out on release or um, this was kind of their, thus the name choices. This was a choice. You, you go to the local juvenile detention center or we place you in this school with a tracking device and you're allowed to go home and, and things like that. So um, a lot of these kids are in gangs. So the, the gang mentality for them is very strong. The structure does not work for them. It doesn't work for the students. It doesn't work for any of the stakeholders, um, if we're being honest. So when we came in and we met with the principal and then we met with teachers and we were working with students when COVID kind of threw a wrench in everything. And um, unfortunately we have not been able to get back um, to working with them, but I have um, spoken to a few of the um, employees there, um, a couple counselors and a, and a teacher who have given me kind of some insight on what's been going on with these kids through COVID and how, you know, how they're making out in this virtual wor learning world that they were not um, used to doing so, but my hope is that once schools reopen that we will be able to go back and um, and, re and interact with these kids and kind of move forward with the plans that we had for them. Thanks, Krista. Thanks, Krista. Thanks for joining us tonight. Brian, would you like to provide some concluding remarks? Now, we're actually going to be having a governance discussion. If anybody's part of it, um, it's going to be going on for a little bit more. And I'm really sorry that tonight's event went over, but it's still going to be on the Zoom via this, the same Zoom link. So. Mm. Well, look, it's, it's good to see everybody. And I hope that uh, we can meet again face to face somewhere. And we're hoping to be able to actually plan something for the spring. <clears throat> but uh, we have to see how things go, but I want to say thanks to Philip and Roger and Yuri and everybody who's been so supportive of everything we've done. We really appreciate the fact that you took a chance on us and let us um, try and put this together. But you guys made it. You made it happen. So thank you, Kim. <laughs> and everything you guys are doing really is inspiring. I'm glad we're able to record this because we can now show students, when we talk about this, it's no longer abstract, it's real. People are doing good things. They're at the right time, right place, doing the right things. So thank you very much. And also a very happy early birthday to Charles, who is part of this call.
Oh, yeah. Charles Hopkins. So, yeah. Not until the 29th, but yeah. <laughs> That's right. Not till. <laughs> don't push it. <laughs> but thank you very much. Happy birthday. I remembered because we were filling out our RC application and you were helping us and you had mentioned it was your birthday. So, yeah. I think he's helped everybody. <laughs> yes. <clears throat> okay. Thanks, Brittany. everybody. Have a great night. I'm going to stay on to facilitate the governance discussion that's going on from 8 to 820. Well, how about 820? Anyway, <laughs> oh, sorry. 826. 826 plus. 826. Oh, and not for EST. Everyone's welcome. For this, so. yes. Everyone's welcome? Yeah. Great. Stay healthy, everyone. Bye bye. Hey, Charles. Um, Brittany, did you have the presentation? I don't know. Or Diego, did you send the new version to Brittany? Oh. Okay. So oh, um, I, have it. I didn't. My bad. Oh, okay. It's okay. <laughs> um, I, I thought, Roger, you would uh share the screen okay okay i think i can do that all right so hold on let me just uh get into that mode here um sorry share screen and which is this one take advantage of your great camera and uh slide show oh, enable everyone in there Sorry to be clear, this is a private meeting, right? So some of us should just step away because you guys are- Well, this is for, no, this correct? is for all the RCs in the Americas. So- Oh, to learn unless about you're not Unless you're not from the Americas, that might be a reason not to be in- the, <laughs> I'm so sorry, I thought this was, I thought I said no, a private this meeting. For, on this the, on the thing. My fault, so, I didn't um, know. <laughs> okay, so uh, I just want to begin by um, uh, introducing the governance working group that has been working to try and put some uh, structure, a little more structure to our relations within the Americas. And I just want to, on this opening slide, you can see the uh, members who've been kind of working on this in sort of an ad hoc way. Um, and and, uh, and uh, we'll have, uh, I'll just begin to introduce a couple of slides, but then uh, Pam and Diego will take the majority of the presentation and Meghna will mention the um, event that's occurring on this Friday. Uh, where we can really get into this in more depth. Uh, and so hopefully all your RCs can at least have a, a one or two people in on that conversation on Friday. So um, as RCs in the Americas, uh, we have been chipping away at this for a long time. We have been building ways of getting together. Uh, I think we are much more grassroots in a lot of ways uh, than perhaps the other continents. And so uh, it's a question of building up trust, just not only at our own local level, but now I think we're at the stage where we can uh, build a lot of good structure. And so uh, we, in 2015, actually, we had a, an agreement coming out of Grand Rapids, which I think we would want to uh, revisit. Um, but a lot of RCs have been collaborating inter-RCE level, and we're really just kind of discovering what the possibility is uh, for those inter-RCE collaborations. Uh, and so just this past year, we had, uh, we've had these conference calls that have been going on pretty much quarterly. Uh, and so we wanted to build a structure that builds on top of what's already occurring. And so the idea being that, you know, form follows function. Let's try and shape something that enhances our local RCE activity and tries to follow what we are already on a trajectory doing. Uh, I just wanted to put up a slide though about our principles, a couple of principles that really are important in thinking about our governance structure. Um, because the, what makes us really viable as RCs is our local autonomy and our ability to do the education for sustainable development work at our local level, the way we need to do it using the expertise that is often grounded in our local communities plus with uh, academic and other expertise. And so um, when we think of a governance structure, uh, the governance structure really has to serve and build the capacity of our local regions. In a way, that's the primary focus. Uh, we are free to disagree. I mean, we all have academic freedom and, and our regions have that too. 
Uh, and so again, we can't have kind of a top-down structure. It really has to be coming from the grassroots of RCEs. Um, the other thing, of course, is the, uh, the freedom of RCEs when we engage in these larger America's projects to participate or not. You know, I think that's important on specific initiatives. And when we're giving voice to RCEs in the Americas, again, RCEs can choose to be represented or not, depending on what the projects are. But we do share common um, identities in terms of the UN and the UN frameworks and the SDGs where we can always advocate and do America's work. The second thing, of course, is where we derive our authority. And so our authority is derived from our acknowledgement by the UN University. Um, and the UN University, I think, wants us to be self-sustaining. That's what makes us sustainable as RCEs. And so in terms of reporting and accountability, we have obligations at that level. And so really it's a question of how do we enhance what we're doing in a way that doesn't uh, make more work for us, but really builds our RCEs. And so uh, what I want to do now is turn it over to Diego and Pam and each of you, I don't know who's going first, but uh, just tell me when you want the slide to move forward and I'll, I'll do it. Okay, I think it's me, uh, slides four through seven. So thanks so much. Hola a todos, que gusto de verles. Uh, it's really nice to see everyone. And hi, Brian and Brittany and everyone from Salisbury. Thank you so much for organizing. This is amazing. And um, it's just a testament to the resilience of our RC Americas during a pandemic. So. Roger has been our guiding light, and uh, Kim, you have a lot to have, you've contributed to most of this. So um, let me just say that Diego wrote this, and I'm, uh, I'm, I'm going to give him credit and, and just let everyone look at the purpose. So we all need a mission statement, right, for why we're organizing. And so our governance working group would be that arrow pointing us in the direction complete as America's RCEs to become a leading network in the region transforming what's possible into action, so not just talking about it, but acting together, and to achieve solid results in the Americas for education for sustainable development, and obviously accom accomplishing the sustainable development goals by 2030. So I wanna thank Jill um, um, from RCE Saskatchewan as well, who started these conversations last year in the wonderful and hard to forget uh, Burlington. So hi everybody in Vermont, it was lovely. and. We started conversations and Maida is on this call, I think right now from Brazil. And at really as a result of those conversations, we started having, like Roger said, some quarterly meetings, we developed some task force. And so this is just like phase two of strengthening our collaboration together in the Americas. Okay, next slide, thanks Roger. So we're gonna skip this slide because this would be sort of an end result and go to the next one, please. And we're thinking that we would have a steering committee and we, we put this in the shape of a circle because the steering committee would be composed of the leaders of task forces, many of which we already have in, in education, sustainable cities. We don't have one in youth, but we certainly have had young people attend our meetings and Chris from Atlanta has certainly been engaged in, in, uh, in, in our youth initiatives. We've coordinated successfully with them in South Carolina. A task force for strategic initiatives, we research. Brandon has been working uh, on research as well. So the idea would be to have um, a network of task forces in specific areas working on specific things. And the heads of those task forces would be on a larger steering committee. And, and the task forces would be obviously thematically based. We could talk about what other task forces we need. Um, they would set the goals, their own goals. They would set their means of, uh, of reporting and reviewing annually, as well as designating their times. Next slide, please. And what would the, the steering committee look like? Um, sort of the organizing structure in a very, I wanna say organizing light structure, not to put too much pressure on anyone, especially during a pandemic. But in addition to having represented representation from all of the task forces to be able to coordinate those activities. We were thinking that, and Kim has really been working a lot on this, on, um, on, on media and communication. We were thinking, uh, and Roger really pointed this out, <clears throat> excuse me, it's a great idea, 
cooperation and outreach to other organizations in the Americas. We have the Organization of American States. Uh, we have the Pan American Development uh, uh, Corporation. So we have a number of inter-American organizations that we haven't reached out to uh, and, and to, to have representation of the SDGs in our work in those organizations. Technical, like a website, et cetera as well as administration and, and potentially other things. And this is up for conversation. Next slide, please. So the task forces we were thinking would have um, maybe some meetings, potentially monthly or maybe not, maybe every other month. They would define their goals, their strategies, their projects, their outcomes. They would manage themselves uh, in, in some type of collaborative tools that the steering committee would help design and um, they would monitor and report, and they would report at our annual meetings to, as a group, see how we're co cooperating and collaborating together. Um, and the idea is that we have so, much, uh, so many rich and robust activities, but we could be better collaborating together, having exchange programs, interjecting our work at the local level and sustainable development at international levels as well applying for grants together and, and Kim sent me a really wonderful idea of a National Science Foundation grant that actually funds networks in the U.S. and outside of the U.S. so that would be a, a perfect opportunity for us. Do you want me to and grab the that, link and put it in the chat? Oh that'd be awesome thanks Kim. Okay. Um, and with that I'm going to let Diego uh, continue and um, I want to give all credit to Diego for uh, creating our slide template and for motivating us. Thank you, Pam. <laughs> hey, hey uh, first of all, it's been amazing, um, R.C. Salisbury, for, you know, um, putting this together. Uh, amazing, amazing work. Um, and uh, thanks to, to everybody, um, you know, Philip, uh, Roger, Chuck, um, you know, the Service Center, all, all of uh, you in, in other RCEs, uh, the work you've been sharing and doing is impressive and, and really, really inspiring. So basically, um, going back to what Pam was saying, uh, actually, I think all of this uh, started in, uh, um, back in 2018 in the meeting we had in, in Argentina. Uh, we started talking about collaboration and, and uh, you know, shared impact. Uh, and then we, we, we sort of picked it up from there in, in Burlington and, uh, you know, gave it a push. So basically what uh, we've been I mean, sort of thinking was to how to put it together and uh, start um, imagining what it would look like uh, to be able to, to to actually go regional in, in, in the whole sense of the word, I mean, a continental, and to, to be able to, to showcase, you know, the, the, the difference the RCE network can, can bring uh, in, the, in, in face of, of the challenges we have during this coming decade. So in, in this sense, this, these are just a, a few ideas that we want to, put forward and share with you. Uh, hopefully, um, many, if not all RCEs will join us uh, this coming Friday uh, to be able to have a, a, a really uh, interesting and dynamic um, discussion and, and, and you know, working session. So the idea is, um, again, to, to organize ourselves in, in a steering committee and, and task forces or, or working groups um, theme-based, as Pam said, so we can focus um, and, and make the most out of our, our commitments, our capacities, our, our efforts, our resources, in order to actually bring, bring about this, this uh, structure mm, for the whole of us. Um, you can see there um, different possibilities that we, they are pointing out, just a few ideas. Next slide. I won't be reading everything, of course. It's a bit too late. Um, so these are, uh, of course, we will be sharing this. Um, the idea is to 
um, share with you, you know, some uh, scopes, mm, um, responsibilities, let's say, uh, possible uh, deliverables or, or you know, outputs mm, for each and every um, committee, task force, or, or you know, commission, etc. Um, the idea of you know, start thinking about it and how to put it together in a in a comprehensive way. Next slide. Mm -hmm. So we have cooperation, we have communication. I think communication and 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 uh, uh, marketing in the good you know uh, in the good sense. Uh, I think it's it's crucial in the sense that we can actually. Uh, um, basically communicate the existence of, of the RCEs and the network and the difference we can, we can make. Um, so in that sense, you know, as we are in a, in a digital world, the, the possibility of, of developing uh, a new identity for us with a logo, a brand ma manual, brand kit, etc. A web portal we've been already sketching out, a communication strategy, um, designing content, developing content, and you know pulling together all the resources we have from different RCEs that would like to join this this committee uh, or task force, so uh, we can actually um, expand the the you know the reach of the things we're doing. Next slide. Hmm. Technical. This is this is a very specific one that I actually part of my presentation in Burlington addressed this. I think we need to um, beef up our game in the sense that we, we need to be in line with uh, the, the narrative and and the things we are proposing uh, from the UN system. Um, in terms of um, education for sustainable development, the 2030 agenda, SDGs, etc., and of course uh, the Paris Agreement and, and other um, frameworks. I believe sooner than later we, uh, as uh, as part of the RC network, should make a public commitment to be carbon neutral at least. Uh, by 2030, the latest, if not earlier. Uh, we need to walk the talk in that sense. And of course, that has to do with uh, being able to do the math and, and do our own calculations of, of, of what that entitles and, and what it takes. Uh, of course, has to do with bringing each and every RCE carbon neutral. Mm -hmm. And of course, how we report on our, our impact and the differences we, we can make in, in terms of uh, responsible production and consumption, biodiversity, water, uh, clean energy, et cetera, et cetera. We need to pull those numbers together and show the collective impact we can actually make. And as Pam was saying, administration in the sense of, of having a team uh, scanning for funding opportunities and and dedicating some some time uh, to you know streamline that that uh, the economics and financial side of things that we know are 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 essential and and sometimes a challenge but there are opportunities that are being untapped and and we we really consider uh, should be addressed um, pronto. Mm? Uh, there, there are too many things to do, um, so we will need resources. Again, research. We, we should be, uh, from my perspective, doing some research on the things that we really uh, consider key in order to advance our, our knowledge uh, on, on the things that are, we're doing uh, to, to develop uh, best practices, etc., but also on the, on the impact that um, on 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 the territory, right, and 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 the audiences, etc. There are tons of different possibilities, but I think we we can um, we can actually do do some uh, some really interesting difference 
there. And of course, share and, and publish evenly. Education, of course, nothing, you know, um, nothing much to add there. We, we, we know what we're talking about. Uh, but again, uh, the, the, the idea of sharing best practices and uh, develop a sort of a trademark of what, you know, education for sustainable uh, development is uh, through the lens of, of an RCE hmm? uh, and actually addressing the challenges we have in the Americas, hmm? which are different from, from perhaps the ones that are happening in other continents. So we need to, we need to actually um, understand what we mean by this. Youth, of course, they, they, uh, they are the, 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 the key element in all this. Um, much of the, of the things that I'm describing are already happening in Bogota. My you know, hats off for, for the kind of things they're doing. Actually, they were showing some, some numbers and, and, and KPIs in terms of the impact they're, they're making. So they're already in line with the spirit of all this. And um, I believe the youth in, in each and every RCE can actually uh, engage with this very easily. Um, and, and strategic initiatives, and in, in, you know, Pam was mentioning um, um, sustainable cities and communities. That's, from my perspective, one possible initiative, one it's, that it's already going, but perhaps we can talk about uh, many others we have tons of, of different possible combinations of sdgs uh, so uh, not only at the local level but also initiatives of cooperation um, at the continental or, or sub-regional levels so there's there's a lot to to think about in in that regard again sustainable cities uh, to be able to to understand uh, how to go about it and 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 make the most out of it, uh, key elements, and yeah, and this is something that I can uh, connect with uh, a, a recent presentation about storytelling. I think that yesterday somebody was um, um, asking which uh, SDG was more relevant to, to, to us. And um, I believe that, of course, there are po multiple possible combinations, but I think it would be interesting to have a conversation regarding storytelling from the perspective of, of the SDGs. Um, what's what's the, the, um, the yellow brick road? Mm -hmm. do we do we start thinking uh sustainable development from the perspective of partnerships and the, the whole purpose is to end poverty or 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 is it that because the sdgs and the 2030 agenda has to do with leaving no one behind then number sdg number 10 um is at the heart of it all mm -hmm. Or, or is it SDG 12, 13, and 15 hmm, at the core of the uh, Education for Sustainable Development uh, an end and not the means to accomplishing sustainable development? I think there's a lot of, of, of um, potential discoveries in, 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 in discussing um, how we structure the storytelling about uh, the challenges we're facing and how the SDGs can actually help us um get the get the story right uh, yeah magna yeah yeah so um we've been working on this for the last uh, few weeks and uh, we figured 20 minutes is not enough time to kind of have a meaningful discussion around this and to put some um action into this thought and so we thought we'll schedule a meeting on Friday from three to five, um, so that people can join and participate and give us feedback on what they think, because what we have presented is just from our discussion 
others might have different ideas. So we just wanted that kind of a feedback. And I know everybody cannot make it. And there will never be a time where everybody can make it. So we just picked a time and a date um, with, as a follow up to this two day meeting, just to keep the momentum going. And like Brittany said, um, we will record it and share it with everyone and perhaps even have a follow up meeting sometimes in November um, to take the conversation forward because like um, uh, from our past experience, I don't think this was something that can be accomplished in two, one two hour meeting. So it's going to take two or three meetings. So uh, we hope everybody can join us on Friday, 3 p.m. Eastern using the Zoom link that Brittany has set up for this uh, meeting. Roger, you have any concluding remarks? Um, no, uh, well. Just a, a, a final word from, from my side. This is a, a timeline that we will share, but yeah. of course it has to do with, um, with goals and, and uh, own expectations and, and, and possibilities. Right. And the sense that, you know, in aligning our work with, with the context, the, the, the fact that we have the, the Education 2030 launch in, in, in Berlin next year. I think it's mm -hmm. a great moment to, to actually, you know, um, make a difference and, and show the next phases of the America's network. But of course, we will have to uh, do it step by step, at, but, you know, aligning uh, uh, ourselves with a, with a shared timeline, I think it's, it's uh, useful. So this is yes. just a few suggestions about it. Right, and our, I, our uh, intention is that if we have a consensus and agree on a structure, uh, perhaps this is something that can be implemented going forward. And we were thinking that at, the, at every RCE of the Americas meeting every year, we can have a meeting of the governance before or after the RCE meeting uh, as a you know, way to just touch base and see what is working, what is not working, what do we have to modify because Everybody has learned from their experience with their respective RC that this is work in progress and committees have to be changed. People drop in, people join. And so it's, it, that's just how things are. So we are hoping this is something that can be implemented next year. Um, and if I might just say, I think part of the value of creating these structures is so that we can mobilize more uh, participants from our local regions to be engaging with each other at, at the uh, Americas level, because I know as coordinators, uh, we, we find this is such a rich experience that we always want to be sharing with our ordinary members who are doing so much good work at our local regional level. And once we have different task forces structured, we can then tap people on the shoulder at our local levels and say, you know, there's a task force and this is exactly in the area you're working in. Would you be willing to be on that committee for on behalf of the RCE? The other thing too is we've got partners who are willing to provide us with technical expertise and so on, but we just need to be asking them and structuring it in some way so that they can put some of their efforts towards the Americas uh, as a whole. So, so I think it's a, a, an opportunity for us to um, uh, really uh, extend the invitation of the good work we've already been doing in terms of our collaboration in the Americas to a much broader set of members, both individuals and organizational partners that we have. Thank you, Roger. Um, so I'm not sure, um, I think we left the day in between this, this meeting and uh, Friday because we wanted people to think about this. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and so I, I, I wonder, Brittany, uh, if, we, if the, these slides can be put somewhere that uh, people can look at uh, and reflect upon. I think people are probably kind of tired right now. Um, Roger, I think they're in the Americas folder, Pam said. Okay. All right. It is on the uh, Google Drive, but yeah, I mean, um, I think we updated it today, so we'll share the latest slide deck on the Google Drive so everybody can access it. But if for, for some reason folks cannot make it on Friday and um, if they can email either one of us or Brittany saying they would be interested to be part of this conversation, we'll make sure that we send them the slide deck separately via email or even keep them um, in the email thread as uh, we proceed forward with future meetings. And, and yeah. don't forget, Maida is here still and yeah. she's our organizer for the Americas uh, meetings quarterly. 
And so we can begin the conversation on Friday and then continue the conversation. We right. always have great participation on those. So we yep. can start thinking about the steering committee and the themes for the task forces. And then we can have sign up sheets for people to think about it maybe after Friday even so that at the next America's RCE meeting, we have some commitments and we break down into some task forces and start with goals, et cetera. It's a process, but yeah. um, I wanna thank Roger and uh, Chris and Meghna and Diego and, and Kim too, and as well as uh, Charles and Philip for inspiring us to at least try. Yeah. This actually conversation started from the uh, last time when we, Myra organized the meeting and we everybody got up the call and Pam and I ended up talking for one hour after that call. <laughs> and then we decided to email Roger and Philip and everybody. So, you know, thank you so much, Myra. <laughs> You're I'm thrilled welcome. that you guys didn't have <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Myra. Maybe we should invite Philip. Do you have anything uh, from the UNU perspective uh, that you would like to say in relation that's to what I, <clears throat> That's what I wanted to ask. I, I think this structure sounds great. It actually sounds a lot more coordinated than the Asia Pacific structure. And I wanted to um, also underline, Roger has a great point in that, please share this with your RCE members. One of the things I do see, and especially in some of the other continental regions, is it is the coordinators doing everything. And they're always complaining about burnout, but then um, they also are reluctant to kind of give up that ownership. And so that's one thing I would really stress to all of you is for these committees, um, please bring in other people from your RCEs. Like that's the only way it's going to be accomplishable. Um, and it's a better experience for them too. Like as we've said, as coordinators, a lot of you get to meet the international component, but a lot of the local RCEs don't. And um, in East Asia, that's been one of the really successful um, aspects of international networking is um, it's not their coordinators in Japan or Korea or China that are going to these um, working group meetings. It's other members, including youth. So um, we see a lot of really good participation regionally or sub-regionally around that. Um, maybe really quickly, are there any other specific questions? Maybe one other thing I will stress is um, in terms of um, grant writing and stuff, um, your area is incredibly diverse. So that is one challenge you have to work with. The other continents don't. There are pretty clear sets of priorities, at least on the sub-regional level for other continents. Um, for all of you, you kind of work with all 17 of the SDGs. And um, just as it's harder with a lot of chefs in the kitchen, it's harder with a lot of chefs that want to make a different dish. So be patient. Um, even if you just get two or three of you together to work on a given project, I think that's a success. Um, but your region is simply so diverse that I would be, I would set the expectation for trying to get like with for example, like Burlington and Puerto Rico have done. I think that's a great start. If you can build on some projects like that, that's fantastic. Um, but from what I've seen with the data I've analyzed, um, your priorities are so diverse, it's going to be very difficult to have all of you working on one given thing, which is fine. You just need to recognize that from the early onset and not be disappointed um, that your different RCEs are gonna have different priorities. Thank you, Philip. That's so wise. And, and on top of it, I mean, I want to just really congratulate the group that did get together and say, let's work on governance, just like other folks. Let's try to work on communications. And, and I know, Jenny, or if anybody here from Atlanta, you guys worked hard in building a structure, and yet it was hard for folks to even be like, let's input data. Like, you, Philip, you've been saying the same thing with, with you and you. So the, my one question, since Philip's on this call too, is even how what role would you see you and you playing even in the communications piece? Like well, where, where do some of these things kind of align with your structure and then what autonomy do we have? So I want to just honor that too. Oh, well, as governance Bigger structures, question. you're pretty autonomous. Um, again, individually, RCEs are um, responsible for reporting. And so whatever governance structure you have, I think should really underlie that because um, you know, reporting one project a year is kind of the bare minimum uh, for an RCE's function. So 
Um, and if you're working on joint projects together, that's great. Like you can both input that as a project. Um, but in terms of organizational structure, we convene, but we usually don't get involved with governance per se. Um, so I'm happy to advise, and I'm sure all of you and you was like, we're happy to provide a platform and a space for convening. Um, but in terms of governance structure, what I've seen here presents looks really good. Um, and um, <clears throat> there's nothing that would like contradict. The only thing I think is important to keep in mind is what Roger mentioned is that um, uh, to quote, you know, from the early 2000s, you do have to go with coalitions of the willing. Like you're, you're not gonna get everyone on board for everything and you have to make peace with that or you're going to get discouraged quickly. Um, so I think that's one of the things the Americas it's very binary compared to other regions. Like mm -hmm. you either want to work completely individually or everyone at once. And what we've seen in other regions is most successes come when it's just like coalitions start forming and it's like, you know, four or five RCEs are like, well, we really want to work on like climate action. Well, let's just do it versus um, pressuring all RCEs to make that their priority and then you get pushback, so. Mm -hmm. Sounds great. And I think the, the point, and I think Diego, you had this on one of the slides, the value of scaling up individual RC projects so that we start participating. So even just at this meeting, there have been so many good projects where the RCs have said, you know, we're willing to have others participate with us in these projects. So we don't need to build, rebuild a project. We just want no. a lot more participation. And, and having somebody that can kind of monitor that and sort of encourage. So it's not just individual RCs sort of pleading, but no, it's like, here's a list of all these different things that if you become an RCE in the Americas, these are the things you can join in on. And I think exactly. the other key thing too is the need to have some kind of body that can assist in, in getting a greater number of RCEs across the Americas. Because I think if we want to change a lot of our national governments where we've got federal states and so on, we need a lot more RCs within each country uh, to be able to to be um, uh, not only have the knowledge but the uh, the kind of uh, collective representation across uh, larger geographic areas. Yeah. I don't know if Thank folks you, saw Dr. this in the chat page. I'm going to put the link in one more time, just as an invitation. But um, United Nations Association is hosting a, 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 the big celebration next Thursday. Um, and the um, Assistant Secretary General of UNEP and several other people are going to be from our region, from the Americas region, is going to, they're going to be presenting. It's just a, like an hour and a half open conversation. So I'll just put the link there again. We want to, it's, it, and again, it's, it's a national, international invitation. So, um, but happy 75th anniversary. Yay to the United Nations. Woohoo. <laughs> Thank you, Kim. Sure. Thanks, there Brittany, for hosting the meeting. This was great today. Thank you yes, so thank much, you everyone. So much, everybody. Thank uh, you, everyone. Everybody. Thank you, everyone. Everyone, really appreciate. Take good care. Okay. See you Friday. Hey. Good to see you. See you. Bye. Hey, Chris. See you soon. Bye bye. Buenas noches. Hermano, nos vemos. Bien, bien. Cuídense. Vos también. <laughs>